Council Member Dorn, will you please sit in the pledge? To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This evening, Council is pleased to have and appreciative to have uh, Faith Leader Sastri to pray with us. So the Lakshmi uh, Ganapati Temple here in Columbus. Welcome to Council. I'm Satyanarayan Shastri. People call me as Shastri, that is my title. I'm a priest. I'm the founder of uh, Lakshmi Ganapati Temple and Hindu Cultural Association of Central Ohio. So basically, we started this uh, organization to foster the universal spirit inculcation of Sanatan Dharma and help inculcate the values of the people, nonviolence and Shraddha and spiritual discipline and devotion to the God. That is most important thing in, the, in this era, this time. So for this, in our uh, Vedic hymns, our epics, uh, it says there are some Vedic most important for the world peace. We chant some, I'm going to chant uh, Vedic hymns. Oh, Ano Abhadra Krata Voyanta Vishwato Adabdha so Aparita sa Udhida Deva nam yatha sadamit brudhe asanapra ayuva rakshitaro dive dive. Deva nam bhadra sumaterujo yatam deva nam rati rabhino nivartatam. Deva na yaprati ranto jivase. Shanta Aprutivi Shiva Manta Riksham Dyorna Devya Bhayamma Astu Shiva Disha Pradesha Udvisha Naapa Vidyata Paripanta Sarva Tashan 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 Tehi Swasti Prajabhya Paripala Inta Amnyaya Namadgena Mahimahisha Go Brahmane Vyashubhamastu Nityam Loka Samastha Sukhino Bhavantu. The conclusion of this prayer is the entire universe must have peace and happiness. Most important is peace. So, peace, how it will come from the people to the, the, the ruler or president or king or whoever. So that from there, all the pe people of the universe, they have to pray, you people, one who lead the country, lead the community, they must be very happy and healthy. So that is, this time I want to uh, say, we have a temple, we uh, started in September 12th, 2012 in Columbus. It is a small. It is in a small place. We are trying to build uh, a new temple, and also it is 10th anniversary, coming on uh, August 27th through September 3rd. So, I, it is my pleasure to invite all of you. Please visit sometime, any day, any time. Please uh, let us know. There's my. Thank you so thank much you for much. thank you so much God for praying with us. Thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. 
Thanks, Thank Barosa de Padilla, Brown Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dispense with the journal? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Are there any corrections or additions to the journal? Seeing none, the journal is approved. Uh, this week's communications proceed by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other uh, communications to be read in the record? No, sir. Before we go into um, our resolutions and announcement from our members, I want to welcome folks to the last meeting uh, before of our summer session. We have a lot on our agenda this evening, and so um, just ask for grace as we uh, move through uh, 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 exciting um, but um, full agenda. Uh, we sent out communications regarding uh, mask wearing uh, to folks in regards to um, the advisory that went out from the public health department on Friday. And so I wanted to give Assistant Health Commissioner uh, Tiffany Krause a moment to address council as to the advisory, um, the health advisory that's uh, out for our city, and then we'll start around the dais. Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Council President Hardin. So Columbus continues to see a rise in COVID-19 cases and the community transmission level for Franklin County was moved from medium to high last week based on countywide case rate and hospital metrics. The case rate in Franklin County is now 214 per 100,000. New hospital admissions were 10.7% and the positivity rate in Franklin County is now 19.8%. On Friday, Columbus Public Health issued a mask advisory recommending everyone to wear a mask indoors and in crowded areas regardless of vaccine status. The advisory follows the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's guidance for areas with high community transmission. So in order to slow the spread of COVID, we, must, we continue to urge every, anyone uh, who is not uh, vaccinated to receive their COVID vaccine or get their booster um, and also get tested if you're sick. Columbus Public Health continues to offer vaccines Monday through Friday at our 200, 240 uh, Parsons location. And for more information on COVID-19, please visit www.columbus.gov backslash public health. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there any questions or, uh, of the Health Commissioner? Just as a, a note of just practicality, folks are welcome to take their mask off as they're speaking. Uh, as they're coming to a, a podium or certainly council members or those who are speaking, but just wanted to ask folks to stay masked up if, if possible while we're in the meeting this evening. With that, uh, we'll go around the dais, starting with council member Bankston. Uh, thank you, council president. Uh, really just uh, two acknowledge acknowledgements this evening and to start us off on a light note. Uh, first, I wanna give a special birthday shout out to my intern, Jonathan Brown, he's here. Uh, he celebrated his 21st birthday here today is actually his birthday. So he's here with us in council chamber. So how exciting is that? Uh, but absolutely. So we have a great internship program here at uh, city council. Uh, and sometimes interns uh, may be seen as something that is a, a job that's not necessarily integral to the team. But uh, Jonathan in these short months has absolutely been integral to our team. I got my start uh, in public service as an intern. So just wanted to make sure I shouted him out, mm -hmm. thank him for all the work that he's doing for my office and for the people of Columbus. Uh, and then also on another note, just want to thank Director Reese uh, and our chair, uh, Brown, for, of Reckon Parks, for an amazing rib and jazz fest. I mean, what I saw was just so amazing last night. So it was to see downtown coming back, to see uh, our community come back together again is just really beautiful. Of course, as you just said, Council President, we have to be safe and be smart about this because we are still in a pandemic, but we can still gather as community. So just my hat is off to you, uh, Director Reese, Chair Brown, for uh, an amazing weekend uh, without a hitch uh, here in the, the city this past weekend. So, and that's all I have. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Bosa de Padilla. Nothing for me this evening, thank you. <laughs> all right. Press Pro Tim. Uh, thank you so much, Council President. Just a quick reminder that our um, Meet Me at the Playground Community Hour series will continue into August. 
Um, we won't be here on a Monday for me to remind you because of uh, August recess, so I'm doing so now. Saturday, August 20th, 2 o'clock to 3.30 p.m. at Blackburn Park. See you there. Councilmember Dorrance. All right. Councilmember Favor. Councilmember <laughs> Remy. Thank you very much, Council President Hardin. Um, it is my pleasure to get to my computer to the right notes here. Uh, I have one resolution, and I'd like to welcome Sue Hetrick, the chair of the Columbus Advisory Committee on Disability Issues, to the podium as I introduce Ordinance 159X 2022 to designate and celebrate July 2022 as National Disability Pride Month in the city of Columbus. Disability Pride Month came to fruition after the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act on July 26, 1990, a landmark law prohibiting discrimination against people with disabilities. Later that year, Boston, Massachusetts held the first Disability Pride Day celebration. Disability Pride Month is an intentional time to celebrate people with disabilities, both visible and invisible, and an opportunity to highlight the various ways in which society can be made more accessible. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention indicates that 25.4% of Ohioans are disabled. Disability Pride Month is not federally recognized, yet various cities, including Los Angeles, New York City, San Antonio, Madison, and Charleston have held celebrations and parades. Accessibility is crucial to ensuring that all members of the public have ex equitable access to our community. Ableism is any form of discrimination towards a disabled person, including in social and legal settings. Despite the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act 32 years ago, many segments of society are only accessible to some. The Columbus Advisory Committee on Disability Issues has greatly contributed towards furthering disability advocacy. These, this committee is made up of 20 volunteers and identified actions make recommendations for such actions and support programs that assure compliance of the Americans with Disabilities Act and other disability related legislation. Now therefore be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby designate and celebrate July 2022 as National Disability Pride Month in the City of Columbus and thank the Columbus Advisory Committee on Disability Issues for their incredible advocacy. Sue Hetrick is the newly named chair of the Columbus Advisory Committee on Disability Issues, which is a committee of volunteers appointed by Mayor Ginther. Sue, thank you so much for coming down to share a few words on the significance of this recognition. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Council Member Remy and President Hardin and Council Members uh, for uh, recognizing the work of the committee. This is my first duty, actually, my very first duty <laughs> as the new chair. And uh, I'm very honored to be here to accept the resolution uh, for your recognition of the significance of the disability community in Columbus. As you said, 25% uh, or about one in four people have uh, disabilities or, and or have family members or friends. We all know somebody uh, who has a disability. And also the significance of the landmark legislation that is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Tomorrow, uh, July 26, is actually the anniversary of the signing of, of uh, the act. So it has just represented significant change for the disability community. We look forward to working um, with council on making Columbus uh, the most inclusive, disability-friendly community in Ohio. So thank you again. Thank you very much. I know that being in this position, also being a realtor, you know, understanding accessibility issues when it comes to owning a home as well as commercial and public buildings is of utmost importance. This is actually the first time the city of Columbus has ever recognized formally the Disability Pride Month, so I'm excited to be able to do that. Um, just a reminder that disabilities could be mental and or physical, and they can be both visible and invisible. Um, before I move for adoption, I, I want to take a second and thank our summer intern, Zeta Jenkins, for her work in suggesting, researching, and preparing this resolution for tonight. This is Zeta's second summer working in my office, and I'm beyond grateful for her contributions. Um, thank you, Zeta. We appreciate your efforts, that's for sure. Um, are there any uh, questions or comments by my colleagues this evening? Seeing none, I move for adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa Di Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. And 
that's all I have. Just want to wish everybody a rest, a great rest of your summer and uh, safe back to school efforts as we take break. Um, but we got a long one ahead of us before we get to that. So have a good evening. Thank you, council member. Are there any comments by our elected officials from the city attorney's office, city auditor's office, city treasurer's office? Seeing none, uh, are there, at this time I request the following ordinances to be removed from the consent portion of the agenda. From the Health and Human Services Committee, we remove ordinance 2094-2022. Uh, and from the Economic Development Committee, remove 2179-2022. Are there any other requests by members of council to remove an ordinance from the consent agenda? Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of title of the 30 legislation. Is there a second? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosity, Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Will the clerk now read to the record ordinance numbers of 30 day legislation on tonight's agenda? Technology Com Committee Ordinance 1219 2022, Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinance 2141 2022, Neighborhoods and Immigrant, Refugee and Migrant Affairs Committee Ordinance 2187 2022, Finance Committee Ordinance 1988 2022, Education Committee. Ordinance 2186-2022, Health and Human Services Committee, Ordinance 1723-2022, Public Safety Committee, Ordinance 2132-2022, Rules and Reference Committee, Ordinance 1617-2022. There's no speakers on the first reading portion of the agenda. The following ordinances appear on our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read those into the record? Economic Development Committee, Resolution 144X-2022, Ordinance of 1791, 2014, 2060, 2065, 2090, 2125, 2126, 2134, 2165, Small and Minority Business Committee, Ordinance 2144-2022, Technology Committee, Ordinance 2119-2022, Public Service and Transportation Committee, Ordinance 2018, 2068, 2115-2022, Neighborhoods and Immigrant, Refugee and Migrant Affairs Committee, Ordinance 2005, 2154, 2201-2022, Finance Committee, Ordinance of 1983, 1996, 2007, 2020, 2054, 2055, 2074, 2080, 2104, 2133, 2138, 2164, 2177, 2180, 2218, Dash 2022 Recreation and Parks Committee, Ordinances 1076, 1612, 1660, 1725, 1746, 1779, 1957, 2189, 2191. Dash 2022 Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 1446, 1841, 1985, 1992, 2137, 2145. Dash 2022 Workforce Development Committee, Ordinances 2149. 2171-2022, Building and Zoning Policy Committee 2143-2022, Housing Committee Ordinances 1772, 1940, 2019, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025, 2028, 2037, 2038, 2040, 2041, 2047, 2048, 2049, 2079, 2098, 2100, 2158, Dash 2022, Criminal Justice and Judiciary Committee 2097 2022, Health and Human Services Committee Ordinances 0254, 2036, 2117, 2118, 2135, 2151, 2197 2022, Public Safety Committee Ordinances 2155 and 2188 2022, Environment Committee Ordinances 2062 2091-2022, Administration Committee, Ordinances 1861, 2063, 2202-2022, Rules and Reference Committee, Ordinance 2192-2022, Appointments from the Mayor's Office, numbered A0154, 155, 156, 157, 158, 159, 160, 161, 162, and 163-2022. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have several uh, speakers on the consent portion of the agenda, starting with Rachel Winning, speaking against Ordinance 2014. Good 
Good evening. Good evening. Just a reminder, if you state your name um, and if you represent any organization, and then you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rachel Wenning. I am a Hilltop Area Commissioner, but for purposes of tonight's meeting, I am simply a resident of Columbus. Uh, this uh, item that I'm speaking on is 2014-2022, which is a downtown incentive agreement. Uh, I know it's a consent agenda item, so I realize it's going to be passed, um, was not removed from the consent agenda, but um, I really just want to speak on it to use it as an example of, I think, how irresponsible some of these types of agreements can be, uh, because I think this one is particularly egregious. Uh, the first whereas clause in this ordinance says, quote, the city desires to increase employment opportunities and encourage the creation of new jobs in the city, uh, which of course makes sense as a good justification for economic agreements uh, to create jobs. Um, but this and health agreement doesn't do that, at least it doesn't guarantee that it's going to do that. What it does is it guarantees money to and health based on its paycheck withholding for city income taxes. Uh, and that's regardless of whether Columbus gets to keep those taxes or not. So those withheld taxes might go to any of the cities that Ann Health's employees uh, live and work in. Uh, I believe a number of them are already working from other cities. If you look at their website, uh, you can see that quite a few people reside in other cities in the U.S., although they work for Ann Health. Um, the deal provides about $384,000 in payments to and Health over five years without guaranteeing that the city of Columbus receives anything of value in return. The only company really guaranteed to benefit from this agreement is Pizzuti, because Pizzuti owns and leases the two Miranova building and the Miranova development as a whole. Uh, according to the Columbus Dispatch, only about one-third of the two Miranova building is currently leased. So in this deal, Pizzuti gets about 21,000 square feet of office space leased by Ann Health. Ann Health gets about $384,000 uh, as a payment based on um, taxes that are withheld. And there's nothing really guaranteed to Columbus. We get a speculative amount of city income taxes if the people they hire happen to live in Columbus. Um, but I think based on the fact that a number of their employees already don't live in Columbus out of the 21 that they currently employ, um, that's pretty speculative. So I think that city council, well, you do owe a fiduciary duty to the people of Columbus. People can obviously disagree on what they think the best actions are to encourage job growth. But what you can't disagree on is putting the requirements in the deal so that there's something guaranteed to the city for the money that we're paying out. If there's going to be actual benefits uh, in terms of an increase in the city income taxes here, it needs to be in the agreement. Um, and the fact that a clear benefit is not guaranteed in the agreement, I think, means that it's very financially irresponsible. Um, and then I just want to comment because I know that Council Member Brown will probably recuse herself from this ordinance uh, because her husband works for Vizuti. But the rest of you also tend to give money to each other when it's your turn to run for office from your campaign finance funds to each other. So I think that certainly most of you have received campaign contributions from Pizzuti on your own as well, and then that sharing of funds also lends the appearance of So I just think those agreements should be contained within um, these offers so that we know we're getting something for our money. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm gonna kick this to the director to speak on this job uh, agreement. Thank you, President Hardin, members of council. This agreement with Ant Health is for the creation of uh, estimated 65 new jobs into the community. We only pay incentive based on the income tax withholdings from those new jobs that are within the city of Columbus. So this is a downtown office incentive. It is a 50% um, performance incentive based on the amount of withholding from those employees who work in and pay income tax to the city of Columbus. And director, is there a mechanism in which uh, if these jobs are not created, uh, in the city that the city would have a mechanism to pull back something like this? Yeah, if those jobs are not created, they are um, not eligible to then receive uh, the incentive. Last week, city council passed the annual payment around our downtown office incentives, and we saw that a decrease in that number based on the fact that it was impacted by remote work. So if those jobs aren't created and the income tax withholding is not, um, threshold is not met, then the payment is not made. Thank you, Director. Are there any other questions or comments uh, on this ordinance from my colleagues? 
Thank you. Thank you, Director. The next speaker to come before council is Ben Shinneberry, speaking on Ordinance 2189. <clears throat> Welcome to council. Just a reminder, please state your name, and if you represent any organization, you have three minutes. <clears throat> My name is Ben Shinneberry. Um, just representing myself. I've had the honor of meeting a few of you throughout the last decade during my work at the Arts and College Preparatory Academy, and before that as co-creator and executive director of the nonprofit We Amplify Voices, formerly known and regrettably named the Dick and Jane Project. I recently shifted careers and now work for a healthcare technology company. Leaving the nonprofit sector has been an eye-opening and surprisingly invigorating experience. Throughout that transition, though, I have kept one foot in the nonprofit world by serving on the board of directors for the Friends of Columbus Metro Parks, and earlier this summer, accepted the position as board president. Friends of Columbus Metro Parks is a simple and straightforward organization that works closely with the staff at the Columbus Metro Parks to put on events and campaigns to encourage public support of the parks. The organization's ultimate task is to serve as an advocate for the Metro Parks and help pass the operating levy every 10 years, a levy that was overwhelmingly approved by voters in 2018. So when I saw the opportunity to be president of an automatically successful organization, coupled with the small possibility of meeting Amy Acton to collaborate on Rapid Five initiatives, I took it. It was a no-brainer. I humbly and graciously stand before you in support of the ordinance to authorize the Director of Recreation and Parks to enter into a grant agreement with Green Columbus to facilitate the ongoing operations of the several programs dedicated to environmental stewardship and the revitalization of the city's tree canopy, another no-brainer. With my remaining time, I respectfully ask to speak to another issue. First heard about the Scioto Audubon Meyer Place development debacle on the evening of July 14th. I was fired up that night, ready to wake up that morning to start fighting for change. But instead of waking up at 7 a.m. as I planned, I woke up at 1 a.m. to a phone call letting me know that my brother, my only sibling, had unexpectedly passed away. The last 11 days have been an indescribable roller coaster, but despite it all, it seems to be leading me toward a very important perspective on life. Two days ago, I returned home to Columbus and began to pro the process of getting back to regularly scheduled life. One of the first things on my list was to watch the recording of the most recent council meeting where the development at Toyota Audubon was discussed. What I watched is not what I expected to watch. No one said anything I disagreed with. And to be clear, I learned everything I know about that situation from watching that session. Never talked to any major players from the Metro Parks about it. I've barely talked to them about anything, ever. No one knows I'm even here right now. The only reason I'm here is to let you know that I've scheduled an email to be sent to your aides and assistants at 8 p.m. tonight, requesting that we hang out sometime during your August recess. We can go for a hike, grab a coffee, meet at your office, or whatever. I just figured I'd have a better chance of scoring a yes if I introduced or reintroduced myself first. I don't have an agenda. I just believe I can help. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shinneberry, and we are so sorry for your loss. Uh, look forward to your outreach. Yes, sir. Uh, the next speaker to come before council is Nate Wilkins, <clears throat> speaking on ordinance 1772-2022. Sixteen twelve Arlington Avenue, uh, North London area resident. Um, I'm speaking for this, but like I said, uh, I just would like to see more money of one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars for two family single homes in South London, but not just in South London. But I like to see this more expanded from South London to North London, all the way up to Cook Road to Morris Road. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Um, uh, we're speaking on Ordinance 1772. The last speaker to come for the consent portion of the agenda um, is Charles Robel, speaking 
uh, on ordinance 2118. Just a reminder, you have three minutes, Mr. Robo. Uh, I just wanted to remind you guys that uh, you can still put it on the ballot tonight to uh, give the electorate a chance to uh, change the name in November. Uh, two members of council have uh, said that we're named for a genocider. Um, two different uh, people on Columbus, uh, YouTube, uh, CTV, have said that the, uh, the monster statue that used to be uh, on the city hall grounds uh, was a flashpoint or a focal point for division and unrest. Uh, so at any point, you know, uh, people could get really angry about the name of the city. So it'd be good if, if we at least gave people a, choi a choice finally. Uh, and then the only other reason I'm here tonight, uh, um, it wasn't totally clear what your comments were last week, uh, President Hardin, but uh, you said when there's misinformation present after all the things that I said, uh, so I was hoping you'd clarify what you thought, if you thought anything I said was misinformation, and I'd be happy to, uh, you know, say what's true, you know, so we can try to all be on the same reality. You know, the, the media tries to make us all really balkanized because they refuse to do their job. Uh, so if you could clarify uh, if you thought anything I said was misinformation and what it was, and I'll be happy to uh, respond. Are you, do you want your time? Yep, I'm done with my time for tonight. All right, well, you can go sit down and I will oh, say. Oh, sure. Yep. Sweet. Thank you, Mr. Robo. Uh, if, if, I, if you would like me to, to speak again, I asked uh, the Assistant Health Commissioner to speak on uh, COVID and uh, what the Health Commission is recommending in terms of vaccines regarding COVID. Um, and I think that they spoke well, and that was to encourage folks, uh, if they're eligible, to get a vaccine. And I think uh, support and uh, want that message out there from the Health Commission. Are there any other questions or comments coming before Council? All right. May I have a motion of approval of these items designated as consent actions? By voice, please. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston. Yes, with the exception of ordinances 254-1772-2014-2117-2135, and 2197-2022, from which I am abstaining. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes, with the exceptions of 2014, 2065, 2090, 2125, 2126, and appointments 158, 160, 161, 162, and 163, on which I'm abstaining. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Faber. Yes, with the exception of Ordinance 1992-2149-2022 and 2202-2022, from which I'm abstaining. Mr. Remy. Yep. President Harden. Yes. Ordinance are passed with the notice exceptions. We'll now proceed with the second reading of 30-day table and emergency legislation. The first committee to come before Council is the Economic Development Committee, chaired by Councilmember Bankston. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, President Hardin. Uh, tonight in the Economic Development Committee for second reading, we first have Ordinance 347-2022 to amend the 2021 capital improvements budget to authorize the city auditor to appropriate and transfer funds from the special income tax to the development taxable bond fund to authorize the expenditure of $12,500,000 from the Development Taxable Bond Fund to the Confluence Community Authority and to declare an emergency. Uh, council colleagues, this ordinance authorizes the final payment that the city is required to pay based off of the contract signed with the Confluence Community Authorities uh, to save the crew back in 2019. Uh, on July 14th, Mayor Ginther announced the city's plan to use these dollars to invest in the development of a community sports park that changes the location to Kilbourne Run, uh, in addition to also investing in the improvements of several other parks in different quadrants of the city. Uh, before I move for passage, Council President, I want to see if our 
Director of Development has anything to add uh, to this ordinance at this time. Thank you, President Hardin, Chair uh, Banks, and members of Council. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, uh, I move for passage by voice. Is there a second? second. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Abstain. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes, ordinance is passed. Next, in the Economic Development Committee for second reading, we have Ordinance 2017-2022 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development enter into an Enterprise Zone Agreement with SFG Columbus Parsons, LLC, uh, for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of the enterprise investing approximately $61.4 million in real property improvements and the creation of 75 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated new annual payroll of approximately $2,340,000. Uh, before I move forward with my comments, we do have one speaker uh, on this ordinance, Mr. Joe Motil. Good evening. Uh, Joe Motil, 167 West Cook Road, Columbus, Ohio. President Harden, Pro Tem Brown, members of this council, explain to me why you would give a city income tax incentive of $385,000 for a meager $1.1 million investment from healthcare startup and health and its Columbus partnership member, Matt Scantlin, just so he can move from Dublin Road to Maranova. And why was this city income tax incentive considered a consent action item? Matt Scantlin received as a co-partner of Cover My Meds $1.1 billion in his sale to the ninth largest company in the world and one of the largest pill dumping opioid distributors in the United States, the McKesson Corporation. The removal of $77,000 a year for five years of city income tax into our city coffers to one of the wealthiest individuals in our region has to be one of the most abusive handouts of corporate welfare I've ever witnessed. But no doubt a portion of this excess of city income tax revenue for Mr. Scantlin will find its way into the campaign committees of the mayor and various city council members. In the course of two consecutive meetings, the mayor and this council will have successfully wiped out $25.7 million in much needed city income tax revenue. City income tax revenue that has been paid out to the likes of Fortune 500 companies such as Cover My Meds, Huntington Bank, Ohio Health, Morgan Stanley, U.S. Bank, along with City Hall favored institutions like the OSU Wexner Medical Center and Nationwide Children's Hospital. These income tax breaks not only reduce funding for vital quality of life infrastructure needs in our neglected neighborhoods, but also results with the employees of these city income tax incentive companies having to pay their employer a share of their city income taxes to work with them. These employees are paying their employers a share of their city income taxes. Isn't this a little backwards? This tax abatement tonight is one of, the, one of seven this evening that will total about $34.2 million, primarily for logistic warehouse facilities. And with the Columbus and Central Ohio region being in one of the most desirable and risk-free logistics areas in the Midwest, if not the country, there is no reason whatsoever to continue defunding public education with these tax abatements. The most recent reported vacancy rate for logistic warehouse space in Central Ohio was 2.1%. Three of these tax abatements are going to a firm that manages over $4 billion in real estate assets across the U.S. Two other tax abatements totaling $7.4 million is going to Columbus Partnership member and City Hall Darling, developer Crawford Hoying, for creating 32 $15 an hour jobs. In all, 189 $15 an hour jobs will be created from $34.2 million in tax abatements. The average monthly rent in Columbus for a one-bedroom apartment is about $1,200. Paying 30% of one's income at $15 an hour, you can only afford a $780 a month rent. You do the math. And anyone who cares to boast about creating $189, $15 an hour defunding public education 
all for the sake of blatant corporate welfare and as a lapdog for luxury real estate developers is drowning in the Kool-Aid they and others provide with you. When will this ever stop? As I speak, there are dozens of CEA members of school te teachers outside the hall, outside of City Hall right now protesting this continuation of defunding public education. When's it gonna stop? It's unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, comments, Mr. Motil. Uh, in particular, Director Stevens, is there anything that you want to uh, speak to in that? And I think that as you see this evening, uh, as we go through the agenda, it is much more uh, jobs being created and opportunities for our residents, but I'll let you uh, chime in, Mr. Uh, Director. Uh, thank you, President Hardin, Chair Banks, and members of council. This is one of three abatements that are gonna be occurring at the former Columbus casting sites, um, a vacant and abandoned uh, manufacturing facility that has uh, been vacant for a while. We are excited to see this type of investment coming back to that neighborhood to bring those industrial manufacturing uh, logistics jobs that would serve those residents as well as other residents in our community. Um, it is a 75% 10 year abatement. It's gonna generate over $2 million in additional uh, property tax on, from that site to the Columbus City Schools that they are not receiving currently. Uh, without this abatement, we will not see this project move forward. Thank you, uh, Director. Uh, and, and, and as the Director said, this ordinance along with the next two ordinances, our package of enterprise zone agreements with SFG Columbus Parsons LLC for the investment in three different buildings. And so that's why it's broken up into three different segments. SFG Columbus Parsons LLC is a subsidiary of Stone Mount Financial Group, an industrial real estate development and investment group headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. SFG is proposing to redevelop the former Columbus Castings industrial site on the south side of Columbus. And if folks are familiar with this site, it is a historic site um, that uh, has been torn down and is sitting empty and vacant currently in the heart of our community. The redevelopment will actually consist of three separate uh, proactive industrial facilities, totaling approximately 859,240 square feet on a vacant land parcel, consisting of approximately 77 acres at 2215 through 2295 Parsons Avenue. For building number one of this development, SFG proposes to invest $61,351,334 in real property investments to construct an a, a, approximately 599,000 square foot Class A proactive industrial facility. This is projected to create 75 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $2 million $340,000. For building number two, uh, that is later on in the ordinance, is SFG proposes to invest approximately $15,178,064 in real property improvements to construct approximately 148,200 square feet. This is projected to create 19 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $592,800. And lastly, but, uh, but not least for building number three, of this project, they plan to invest approximately $11,470,602 in real property investment to construct approximately 112,000 square feet. And this portion of the project is anticipated to create 14 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $436,800. In sum, with all three buildings, Columbus City Schools are estimated to receive an addition, over an additional $2 million, as the director stated, over the term of the abatement. And just to be clear, the current value of the property doesn't go away. It continues to go to our school district. That additional 25% that they would not have received if it sat empty is valued at $2 million over 10 years. Just to be clear. To also be clear, over the life of this property, because of this investment over 20 years, it will result in $20,184,116 uh, $184, And so I understand this narrative of what it feels like right now, but what we are investing in is opportunity for our people, and that return on investment is almost in most cases two and threefold for our schools. And so with that, Council President, I will pause there. If there are any questions or comments from my colleagues? 
Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Next in economic development for second reading is uh, building number two of that package, Ordinance 2067 2022, to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with SFG Columbus Parsons LLC for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of the enterprise investing approximately 15.1 million in real property improvements and the creation of 19 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated new annual payroll of approximately $592,800. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Pass. And next is Ordinance 2064-2022. Again, this is building number three of that total project at Parsons Avenue to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with SFG Columbus Parsons LLC, the enterprise for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of the enterprise investing approximately 11.4 million in real property improvements and the creation of 14 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated new annual payroll of approximately $436,800. Seeing no comments or questions from my colleagues, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Next uh, in the Economic Development Committee for second reading, we have Ordinance 2035-2022 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with Patton Ohio Investment LLC and Patton Warehousing LLC, collectively known as the Enterprise, for a tax abatement of 65% of excuse me, for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of the enterprise investing approximately 10 million in real property improvements, the retention of 17 full-time jobs with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $635,760 and the creation of eight new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $282,880,000 at the project site. Patton Ohio Investment LLC is a family owned uh, col with Columbus roots right here and operates a real estate holding company uh, looking to expand their distribution and warehouse facility uh, an additional 194,000 square feet at 650 Maynard Park Drive. Uh, we, the team did some proactive outreach and, and actually Patton reached out to us uh, and without uh, this agreement and, and the expansion Patton Ohio Investment LLC uh, and the Patton Warehouse LLC were looking to move, actually to move their location, uh, which would have left a vacant building on the far west side of Columbus, which we know needs uh, continuous investment, and also would have potentially uh, lost 17 jobs. And so we here tonight are making sure that we are keeping those jobs in the city of Columbus. They have proposed to invest the total project cost of approximately 10 million for the expansion which will retain 17 full-time jobs with an annual payroll of approximately $5,675,760 and will create eight new net full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $282,880. Uh, seeing no comments or questions from my colleagues, I move for passage at this time. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Next in the Economic Development Committee uh, for second reading, we have Ordinance 2044-2022 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with CH Outer Belt Acquisition LLC uh, for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of the enterprise investing approximately $24.2 million in real property improvements and the creation of 23 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $738,400. Uh, CH Outerbound Acquisition is a partnership that is comprised of three members of Crawford Point. This ordinance along with the next ordinance, so the next uh, ordinance, are enterprise zone agreements for the construction of two buildings at zero Outer Belt Street. CH Outer Belt is proposing to invest a total project cost for building number one 
of roughly $24,239,586 in real property improvements to construct an approximately 183,000 square foot Class A proactive industrial facility. This will lead to the creation of 23 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated new annual payroll of approximately $738,400. For building number two, which is the next ordinance, they are proposing to invest approximately $8,522,481 in real property improvements to construct an approximately 80,000 square foot Class A proactive industrial facility. This will lead to the creation of 10 new net full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $312,000. So between the two of these projects, a creation of 33 new jobs. These two buildings are set to increase Columbus's cold storage capacity, which is greatly lacking in our region. Uh, I would like to in, uh, invite Director uh, Stevens to, to talk more about this, because uh, what this is really doing is putting us uh, in competition and putting us at a competitive advantage. Right now, we are at a disadvantage because of this particular type uh, of industry, uh, which is cold storage. And so, Director Stevens, if you could speak to that a little bit more and why this is so critical to our overall e uh, economy. President Hardin, Chair Banks, and members of Council, as we are working to attract new investment and new jobs to the City of Columbus, we know there's an uh, industry out there around cold storage, whether it's pharmaceutical, food, or others, that really was exasperated during the pandemic of needing the space. And what we have found is the space that exists now is either antiquated and, and doesn't meet the requirements of the uh, companies we are working with and trying to attract here. So this, by putting this in place, we are going to have the space available to attract those uh, jobs and that investment uh, I'll, I'll with those industries. And, and Director Stevens, you know, as it sits right now, we're losing out on opportunities for RFPs and bids that we can't go after because we don't have the amount of cold storage that we need uh, in not just Columbus, but in our region. Yeah, that's correct, Council Member. Um, last year, Council uh, approved an abatement for a uh, cold storage facility on the south side of Columbus. Uh, now we're trying to get one on the east, west, and the north side as well. Absolutely. So thank you, Director Stevens, for those comments. Uh, again, this isn't simply about uh, just creating new jobs and opportunities for our residents, which is always our end goal, but it's also about making sure that we are a competitive uh, economy in this space uh, and continue to grow uh, in this critical area that will continue uh, to excel uh, as we see with uh, the supply chain issues that we see around the country. Uh, seeing no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage at this time. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next, we have Ordinance 2045-2022 to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with CH Outer Belt, Outer Belt Acquisition, LLC, for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of the enterprise investing approximately $8.52 million in real property improvements and the creation of 10 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $738,400. Again, to clarify, this is building number two uh, of that overall project. Uh, first, uh, sorry, seeing no comments or questions from my colleagues. Uh, first, I motion to amend uh, this as submitted to the clerk. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Amend it. And now I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next, we have Ordinance 2086-2022 to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with Becknell Industrial uh, Dealing Business as BI Developer LLC for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of the enterprise investing approximately $37 million in real property improvements and the creation of 50 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated new annual payroll of approximately $1,580,800. Becknell is a privately held national real estate development firm focused heavily on industrial buildings, including distribution centers, warehouses, processing and assembly plants, manufacturing plants, research and development centers, service centers, and other facilities vital to the global supply chain management of regional, national, and multinational operations. They are proposing to invest a total project cost of approximately $43 million 
which includes six million in acquisition costs, 37 million in real property improvements to construct an approximately 527,000 square foot class A proactive industrial facility on a vacant land parcel containing approximately 42.2 acres at 5811 Gender Road. This enterprise zone agreement will lead to significant investment in the greater Southeast area. And both the Development Commission and the Greater South Area East Commission gave unanimous approval for the zoning associated with this project uh, just last month. The development of this site will increase Columbus City School District's property tax revenue from this site from $1,727. So currently right now, this vacant 42.2 acre parcel of land is going to is accumulating only $1,727 for our schools. Over the life of this abatement, that additional 25% that we're talking about, they continue to receive that $1,727, but they will also get an increase of $171,457 annually for the next 10 years. Additionally, the Columbus City School District is estimated to receive an additional $1,697 $300 over the term of the abatement and approximately $8,486,500 over a 20 year period as a result of this construction project. Again, turning vacant land into productive uses, not only for our schools, but also for the opportunities and people that get to work there. If there seeing no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage at this time. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Horton. Passed. Uh, next, we have Ordinance 2009-2022 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a job creation tax agreement of 65% for a period of 10 consecutive years with BBI Logistics, LLC, in consideration of the company's total proposed capital investment of, of approximately $56 million $527,136, uh, re the retention of 170 full-time positions with an annual payroll of approximately $12,867,400, and the proposed creation of approximately 953 net new full-time permanent positions with an annual payroll of approximately $80,577,408 over the full 10 year term of the incentive. BBI Logistics LLC was established in 2017 as a freight brokerage firm specializing in handling full truckload shipments also, while also dealing with a variety of other services such as less than truckload, intermodal, specialized equipment, and expediting shipments. They are proposing to invest a total capital expenditure of approximately $56 million which includes 4.4 million in acquisition costs, 32.8 million in new construction, 4 million in machinery and equipment, 4.8 million in furniture and fixtures, 4.5 million in computers, and 5.9 million in leasehold improvements to create a new corporate headquarters at 600 West Nationwide Boulevard in the Arena District. This massive proposed expansion is projected to create approximately, again, 900 and 53 net new full-time permanent positions with an annual payroll of approximately $80 million over the 10 years. It will also incentivize and retain the current 175 full-time positions that they have and base their headquarters here in Columbus. Seeing no comments or questions from my colleagues, I move for passage at this time. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you, Council President. And at, for our next ordinance, I will uh, defer to Vice Chair Remy uh, for our next ordinance. Thank you very much, Chair Bankston. Ordinance number 2061-2022 is to authorize the expenditure of funds in the Development Taxable Bonds Fund to authorize the Director of the Development 
Direct Department of Development to enter into contracts and or reimburse NWD Investments, LLC, in an amount of up to $5 million in connection with the costs of the public infrastructure improvements located along Vine Street and Goodale Boulevard on the east and west side of Neal Avenue pursuant to the amended and restated TIF agreement dated October 31st, 2019, and its subsequent agreements authorized by Ordinance 2043-2019 as amended by Ordinance 2932-2021 and to declare an emergency. The city and NWD are engaged in a public-private partnership to coordinate the design and construction of a public infrastructure improvements necessary to support new mixed-use development projects in the Arena District. This legislation authorizes the expenditure of the first $5 million of the public infrastructure commitment in the 2020 2021 capital improvement budget approved by City Council with the passage of Ordinance 2707-2021 on November 1st, 2021. The first $5 million will be used to reimburse NWD for the Arena District improvements associated with the Hamilton Parker Phase 1 site redevelopment, a portion of which was completed in 2021 and included a new 130,000 square foot office building and 600 space structured parking garage. The city is authorized by Ordinance 2043-2021 as amended by Ordinance 2932-2021 passed by Council on December 6, 2021 to execute subsequent agreements and instruments with NWD related to the Arena District improvements pursuant to the TIF agreement. The Arena District improvements to date have included the reconstruction of Kilbourne Street, widening of Neal Avenue north of Vine Street, and the resurfacing of Vine Street, Spruce Street, and Armstrong Street, relocation of the city of Columbus Division of power poles and equipment along the west side of Kilbourne Street, combined sewer relocation and relocation of combined sewer on Vine Street between Kilbourne Street and Neal Avenue. Director Stevens, do you have any additional comments you would like to share on this ordinance? Thank you, President Hardin, Chair Ramey, uh, members of council. This is the continued investment in um, the Arena District as we move westward to, uh, in, to in, in incentivize new uh, jobs in the area. I think it, you know, the previous uh, ordinance dealt with the growth of BBI logistics, which is just west of there. So this is a, a continued investment in that area to track jobs. Thank you very much, Director. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments this evening? Seeing none, I move for passage by voice. Okay. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston. Abstain. Ms. Barosa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Favor. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Thank you, Council Board President. I'll turn the floor back over to Chair Bankston. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Remy. Uh, last in the Economic Development Committee for second reading, we have Ordinance 2179 2022 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a contract with Design Local LTD in the amount up to $253,000 for the purpose of public education and facilitating the community and public discussion about the potential reinstallation of the Christopher Columbus statue to a public location to authorize the transfer of $253,000 between the Department of Development's Administration Division and Planning Division to authorize the expenditure of $253,000 from the Division of Planning's General Fund budget and to declare an emergency. Uh, first, on this particular ordinance, uh, I would like to thank all the residents who reached out to our office with comments and concerns uh, about this ordinance and piece of legislation. Uh, democracy works best when the folks we represent join us at the table for the discussions such as these. So I am appreciative that folks took the time out of their busy day to communicate with us. Given the response we received from the community, uh, both for and against, uh, I would like to motion to table this ordinance indefinitely. Uh, I understand that the handling of the Christopher Columbus statue is a difficult subject. And I believe that we, have, we can have a thoughtful conversation about what needs to be done with the statue. Uh, and, I th and I also want to uh, make sure that we make it very clear that the intention of this ordinance was never ever that Christopher Columbus would be back here at City Hall or on any city property. Uh, but it is clear to me that there is more work that needs to be done uh, by uh, our, the administration to make sure that we're having a thoughtful conversation around this. Uh, Director Stevens, do you have anything you would like to add regarding uh, this 
particular ordinance. President Hardin, Chair Bankston, members of council, uh, we have been engaged over these last two years uh, thoughtfully and thoroughly with the community on, on the discussion on this piece of public art. Uh, we will continue to do that and we look forward to working with you in the future on this. Uh, thank you, Director. I think we have, we had three speakers uh, for this ordinance. Are any of them still here? Mr. Uh, Kramer, Mr. Proton, or Mr. Byer, Byers? Okay, I do not see them. Uh, so with that, Council President, uh, I move that we table this uh, ordinance indefinitely. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Table. Uh, thank you, Council President. I have one item in Rules and Reference Committee. May I move there, please? Please. Uh, thank you. Tonight in Rules and Reference, we have Ordinance 3215-2022 to amend Section 371.02 and 371.18 and to enact section 371.20 of chapter 371 of the Columbus City Codes in order to amend the distribution schedule of the hotel, motel short-term rental excess taxes to segregate a portion of the hotel motel short-term rental uh, excess taxes generated by the hotel to be constructed at the North Market so that such funds may be used to subsidize affordable workforce housing pursuant to the economic development agreement dated September 11th, 2019 by and between the city North Market Development Authority Inc. and NM Developer LLC as modified by the letter dated August 9th, 2021 from the city to NM Developer LLC to establish two new city funds, North Market Housing Fund and North Market Capital Maintenance Fund for the deposit of a portion of the hotel motel short-term rental excess taxes generated from the hotel to be constructed at the North Market to authorize the North Market Workforce Housing Agreement between the city and NM Developer LLC and to authorize the North Market Capital Maintenance Agreement between the city and North Market Development Authority, Inc. Uh, this ordinance amends the hotel motel tax provision for the North Market so that 3.6% of the 5.1% of the hotel motel tax is deposited in a housing and capital maintenance fund that will be used to add affordable housing units into the project. The remaining 1.5% will continue to be distributed normally. The original economic development agreement for this project was passed back in 2019. And so this ordinance today is just really a procedural vote to make that code change uh, that was already uh, voted on back in 2019. Uh, Director Stevens, do you have anything to add about this particular ordinance? Uh, President Hardin, Chair of Banks and members of council, uh, this, is, this project continues to move forward. Um, we're looking at a groundbreaking in the fourth quarter of this year. Um, I think you covered the explanation of the ordinance really well and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And, and just to, to clarify for folks, Director, this is one of those projects where there was no affordability requirement. Uh, and at the request of the city to the developer to make sure that there was affordability in it, uh, they were able to do that. And, and we did that in a creative way, correct? That's correct. And then lastly, I know we continue to have ownership of the North Market. And we know that there's huge capital expenditures that go with that. So creating a fund uh, that will, in perpetuity, help to offset those costs and make investments, I think is critical to our capital budget capacity. That's correct. Thank you, uh, Director. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I first move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Oh, we have a speaker? Oh, sorry about that. We do have a speaker. <laughs> Thank you, council members, uh, for catching me. Uh, we have uh, David, I'm sorry. David Carlack is here uh, to speak uh, against this ordinance. Mr. Carlack, you have three minutes. Uh, your name, address, and who you represent. My name is David Carlack. I live at 4547 East Livingston Avenue in Columbus, Ohio. I last spoke to this uh, council 
in 2019 to inform them that the uh, parcel that is under uh, that they entered into uh, uh, agree an agreement with the, the uh, developers is the North Graveyard of the City of Columbus. That's the legal definition on the uh, county auditor's website. There are hundreds of graves under the uh, piece of land that's disrespectfully referred to as the parking lot. That piece of land uh, was ceded to the city back in 1831 by Colonel William uh, by Colonel William Doherty. He was a veteran of the War of 1812. His father fought in the American Revolution. His two of his uncles died in the American Revolution. His father-in-law was Jeremiah McLean, who was a major general in the Revolutionary War, and he also represented the city of Columbus in the, the 24th and 25th U.S. Congress, and he's buried in, he is buried in the uh, Congressional Cemetery. Um, the McLeans and the uh, Doherty's lived on High Street adjacent to the property. Um, uh, Colonel uh, uh, Doherty came here from North Carolina, and he brought his slaves or as I prefer to call them, enslaved people, to Columbus, Ohio, okay? He was, by today's standards, a racist. Uh, by uh, 1849, his grave was moved to Green Lawn Cemetery when it first opened. It was the new private luxury cemetery. The North, Mar the North Graveyard was a, a graveyard where people of all races, religions, and color, uh, and, and, and uh, and backgrounds could be buried equally. And uh, William Doherty didn't move his enslaved people to Greenlawn Cemetery. It was whites only. Uh, in 1856, uh, the uh, Board of Trustees passed a resolution to bar black people from being buried there. So the graves that are going to be dug up in the North uh, uh, Market parking lot, or the Doherty Tract, are former slaves. And they're the last remnants that uh, 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 black individuals may have to their uh, ancestry through DNA. My ancestor is buried there, uh, uh, as is uh, 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 the Honorable Judge John C. Kerr, which is the first portrait out in the hallway. He was the second mayor of the borough of Columbus. The graveyard predates the city charter. It wasn't closed until 1879. There are hundreds of graves there. Why the city went down this garden path with the developers on that one particular spot, uh, uh, you know, S Stephen Shoney led them there. Then he went on to, to uh, 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 Upper Arlington and became the city manager where he also um, obstructed the exhumation of, of a black cemetery under the parking lot of the uh, 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 high school in Upper Arlington. And that land isn't even going to be conveyed. By, according to, uh, uh, the Ohio Revised Code, section 759.07, each grave has to be individually removed. My ancestor's gravestone was lost, but my ancestor, Magdalena Lehman, who died in 1833 of, a, of cholera, has matrilineal descendants. And their DNA can be matched to the DNA that's going to be exhumed from those graves. I don't know if the developer is ready to, or the city is ready to pay for the cost of DNA analysis. But, um, be advised that there may be a class action lawsuit because the grandson of, of uh, William Do Colonel William Doherty was Henry Latham Doherty, and he built a skyscraper in the financial district of Lower Manhattan in New York City that was 66 stories tall. It's still there. He was an oil tycoon. He founded City Service co uh, Company, and he also founded Sitco Oil. So. What you're referring to as a parking lot is hallowed ground. And I hope that the, uh, the uh, investors in this are, on, are gonna be advised Thank that, that, the, uh, that there may be Thank a uh, notice of leap pendants. Thank you, Mr. Carlack. We appreciate that. I'm gonna have Director Stevens speak to anything that's happening with uh, the uh, grave sites. President Hardin, Chair Banks, and members of council, um, the developer is aware of the uh, situation of, of the graveyard. Um, they are taking proper protocols are in place to ensure that we are addressing any remains we find with um, respectfully and with care uh, and, and putting them in, in, in 
transferring them to a, a proper cemetery um, as opposed to the site where the parking lot now sits. Thank you, Director Stevens. Thank you again, Mr. Carlack, for your advocacy. Uh, now, I will uh, first move to amend as submitted to the clerk by voice. Clark, please call the row by Ms. voice. Mr. Bankston. Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorrance. Yes. Ms. Faber. No. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes. Uh, I now move for passage by voice. Is there a second? Second. Clerk, please call the row by voice. Mr. Bankston. Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla. Ms. Brown, Mr. Dorans, yes. Ms. Faber, Mr. Remy, yes. President Harden. Technology Committee, I just want to just reiterate tonight in Economic Development Committee uh, that we have just passed a total of $231,222,000 in capital investment that created 1,217 jobs and retained 213 jobs. That's 1,217 new opportunities for our residents and 213 individuals that could continue to provide for themselves and their family. That's what this work is about. And I know that there may be competing narratives, uh, but at the end of the day, this is about the long-term investment in our long-term strategy uh, for our residents uh, and for the city of Columbus. Uh, with that, Council President, may I move to technology committee? Actually, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna ask for a uh, recess so we can take our probably our first break of a long evening. Um, is there a motion to recess before zoning? Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. We are in recess. We hope to get back to zoning at 635-ish.
Thank you. 
Number 39 will now come to order. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa, De Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Yes. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa, De Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Are there any additions or corrections to the journal? Hearing none, the journal is approved. We'll now go to the zoning committee. Councilmember Dorans chairs that committee and all members serve on it. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Um, before we begin tonight's zoning agenda, allow me to briefly explain our current rules pertaining to speaking before council on a rezoning or a council variance. We will only hear a staff presentation for ordinances that have disapproval from a recommended body or if we have a public speaker to sign up against an ordinance. Tonight we have seven uh, speaker slips filled out by members of the public. Uh, all speakers on council variances, including city staff, area commissioners, applicants, and members of the public will need to be sworn in before they give testimony. Representatives of an area commission and applicants are always able to speak on an ordinance and do not need to fill out a speaker slip. On the advice of the city attorney's office, I will now swear in city staff. Um, please stand. Do you swear or affirm that testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and nothing but the truth as you shall answer in the pains or penalty of, er of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. Thank you. Please let the record re uh, reflect that Shannon Pine for the Department of Building and Zoning Services and Dan, Dan Pleschmidt from the Department of Public Service have been sworn in. Uh, move first rezoning. We have rezoning 1850-2022 to rezone 720 East Long Street being 0.94 plus acres located in the northwest corner of East Long Street and Hamilton Avenue and east and west sides of Hamilton Avenue 170 plus feet north of East Long Street from CPD Commercial Plan Development District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is Kelly Companies, care of Dave Perry agent. The proposed use is a mixed-use development. Seize department recommendation is approval. The Development Com Commission's recommendation is approval 4-2. Near East Air Commission's recommendation is approval 3-1-2. Uh, we have five public speakers signed up to speak on this ordinance tonight. So this time I'd like to turn the, the mic over to planning manager from the uh, BZS, uh, Shannon Pine, for a presentation. Ms. Pine? Good evening. The 0.94 acre site consists of three parcels developed with a funeral home and associated parking lots in the CPD commercial plan development district. The site is also within the, the funeral home parcel is within the East Long Street urban commercial overlay. The requested CPD commercial plan development will permit uh, sub area A to be redeveloped with a mixed use building containing 90 apartment units. 5,500 square feet of eating and drinking establishment space with 450 square feet of accessory outdoor dining and 50 enclosed parking spaces. 
Area B will be a 23 or 25 space parking lot and area C will be a 24 space parking lot. The parking spaces within areas B and C are solely for those uses within sub area A. The CPD text proposes C4 commercial district uses and supplemental development standards addressing building height, building and parking setbacks, right of way dedication, traffic access, pedestrian connectivity, landscaping, fencing, building materials code modifications to interior parking lot landscaping, parking setbacks, C4 development limitations, maneuvering, parking space size, vision clearance, and a parking space reduction from 185 required to 99 or 97 provided spaces are included in this request. The proposed uses are consistent with the Near East Area Plan, which recommends high density residential mixed use land uses for this corridor. Requested CPD district includes a commitment to develop the site in accordance with the submitted site plan, which provides fencing adjacent to properties to the north, pedestrian connectivity between area A and the parking areas, traffic access to area A moved to Kiefer Avenue, adequate vision clearance and right of way dedication in area A, and activation of the ground floor corner of area A at Long Street and Hamilton Avenue with commercial and outdoor patio uses. A parking study was completed and reviewed to the satisfaction of the Department of Public Service. The requested CPD district is consistent with other urban mixed use developments along historic commercial corridors and includes appropriate use restrictions and development standards. Therefore, the city department's recommendation is for approval and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pine. Do my colleagues have any questions for the department at this point? Seeing none, uh, since we have speakers signed up uh, against this ordinance, I would ask for a presentation from the applicant at this time. Mr. Perry? Thank you. Good evening, President Hardin, Zoning Chair Dorans, and all council members. My name is Dave Perry. I'm here tonight as agent for the Kelly Companies for the proposal at East Long Street and Hamilton. The um, proposal, the development proposal is as explained by staff, five-story building, 90 units, um, commercial component to activate the Long Street corridor and to immediately adjacent but off-site surface parking lots associated with the funeral home presently where the building is proposed. The, um, this, this is just simply an amazing project. The, the site is at the entrance to NIAC at uh, East Long. It's at the uh, entrance to Bronzeville at East Long and I-670. And um, the Near East Plan supports the project with high density, uh, uh, high density mixed use development recommendation. It is supported by NIAC, it is supported by the Development Commission, it is supported by staff. There are uh, members of the Near East side to, um, here tonight to speak on behalf of this application. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any uh, specific questions about the project, but. Um, this is just an amazing project, and this building will be a statement piece at the entrance to NIAC and Bronzeville. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Do my colleagues have any questions at this point for the applicant? Seeing none, thank you. Um, next speaker we have signed up to speak on this ordinance tonight is Ms. Kathleen Bailey. Ms. Bailey? Ms. Bailey, you are a veteran in these halls, but I will remind you, you've got three minutes and please state any group organization you're representing. I'll but thank you for down. being here. <laughs> uh, Council, Council President Hardin and the rest of council members, I am privileged to speak tonight about this particular project. I moved into the Near East side in 1984. I have been at my current location since 1989. So I guess that means I kind of like it. Um, I, rem I moved over there, P there were houses that were boarded up, there were houses that were decrepit, and again, I would walk the streets and I felt a pulse beat there. This is an older neighborhood. Older neighborhoods have spirits. And the, I wasn't there when the uh, freeway pretty much eviscerated the neighborhoods, and then to be honest with you, the city wasn't too interested in that area. So, but I would walk those streets, 
I look and I say, I know what this used to look like. I know what this used to be. So I'm proud to be here tonight. I know we've been talking about history tonight. I'm proud because I'm here to support not a development. I'm here to support a vision. Um, I'm just a big fan of the 20s and 30s. I love that style anyway. But I'd always hear from people on PBS when I go to black history meetings about how what Longstreet was this, Longstreet was wonderful. Well, I think it's time to bring it back. And I just thank God that I live long enough to see the turnaround. Because I tell you, we went, I mean, I'm not the only one that suffered, but I know the only person who ever supported me was Walter Cates, if anybody ever remembers him. But um, it's just wonderful. And Mr. Kelly, and all of the things that he's done on the Near East Side, he has embodied the spirit. And that's a difference. That's a step up from somebody who just builds a nice looking building. He's embodied the spirit of what used to be the Near East Side, of the greatness of Longstreet, of Mount Vernon, of all the things I've heard about how wonderful it was. And again, I could always envision it, but it took so long. But I, again, I'm glad I'm still alive to stand in front of you and say this is wonderful. This is not a development. This is a vision come true. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. I also want to pause. I, I forgot to ask if there, we have any uh, representatives of the current representatives of the Near East Area Commission here tonight that would like to speak. All right, not seeing anyone else from NEAC at this point. Um, the next public speaker we have to speak uh, on this ordinance is Mr. James Ebright. Mr. Ebright, please come to the podium. Mr. Ebright, welcome to council, and uh, you have uh, three minutes, and uh, please state any organization that you may represent here this evening. Uh, my name is James Robert Ebright. I live at 186 Hamilton Avenue, and in 1977, my wife stood right here in front of President uh, Hammond and said uh, we were looking at buying a house in the Near East Side, but that the neighborhood had been redlined by the FHA. And I was pretty sure I could get financing one way or another. I moved into uh, um, a nice old Queen, Queen Anne Victorian. And, and it worked out. Uh, and Jerry Gafford and, and Hammond, et cetera, worked on, uh, on getting uh, uh, the FHA turned around. Fortunately, the former chairman of the Franklin County Democratic Party was running HUD in Chicago at the time. <laughs> so, they, so Fran Ryan was, was useful. Um, I've been fighting this thing for a couple of reasons, and there are two that are really relevant to council. Number one, I think, is to address the revitalization that this is supposed to bring. Uh, my degree from MIT is in city planning. So I understand what's going on here. And I, I have lived in the Near East Side since 1978. So I understand what happens in the Near East Side. The plaza has not worked out what we thought it would be. Singletary's is gone. Uh, none of the promises of development that we just heard lauded so much have actually been occurring. This, it is council's responsibility to make sure that the incentives it is giving developers are paid back with something worth the incentives. And we just have not seen the revitalization. There's a number of reasons for that, but uh, I only have three minutes. Uh, and there was one other thing I wanted to talk about, which was this being the largest gentrification project the city has ever done. Now, gentrification is an extremely explosive issue, uh, and CMHA has done such a crap, excuse me, I'm not allowed to use that, it has done a very poor job in meeting its responsibilities for providing low-income housing. Uh, we're living with this every day. We're living with homelessness every day. And promoting projects like this 
only make it worse. Um, and one quick thing, uh, MIT's School of Architecture would probably withdraw my degree if I didn't say the architecture of this building isn't really very nice. Um, I don't want to get personal about it. But, uh, it was one of the reasons that the Development Commission uh, uh, generated some negative votes on it. So um, if you got any questions, I will, I, I will say one thing. Jerry Hammond used to tutor me when I was on the school board. And, and Jerry said, uh, Jim, you're telling people all these good things, all these rational things, all these things that, that, that the school should be doing. How's that working out? And I said, well, Jerry, they're not doing anything. And uh, he said, well, that's because the only way to get anything done in politics is to, is to do favors for people and get them to owe you. And that way, when you need something from them, you've got an audience. Uh, I'm sorry, I, 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 Willis uh, uh, comes down a lot, but I avoid uh, these kinds of bodies having spent a lot of time on school board at, um, at uh, long meetings. And I will end my remarks here. If you got any questions, I'll answer them. But Thank you, never do Thank, ask questions. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> any questions for Mr. Uh, thank you. Uh, seeing none, I will ask for the next speaker we have in this ordinance, uh, Matina Bliss. Ms. Bliss? Thank you for being here this evening. Welcome to council. Uh, by this time, you've already heard me, but you have three minutes, and uh, please let us know if you're representing any organization. Great, thank you. Um, thank you all for allowing me to speak this evening. My name is Matina Bliss. I live at 108 Hamilton Avenue, and I am here in opposition to uh, 720 East Long Street. So what I really wanna focus on during my time is the fact that we, we do need housing in, in Columbus, Ohio. There's a huge need for housing. Not luxury apartments though, especially in the Bronzeville King Lincoln neighborhood. In the past year, we've had multiple, or in the past couple years, we've had multiple luxury apartment complexes go in. One being the Adelphi that has 130 units, constantly has vacancies. The Frisbee that went up on the corner of Hamilton and Broad Street, 67 units, 43 are vacant. They can't fill them because no one can afford to live there. And now we wanna put up the deal, which has 92 units with 50 parking spaces for residents. That doesn't really make any sense. Um, and then also the Ogden, which is going to go up a couple blocks down, which is 78 luxury apartment units. Where's the affordable housing? Where are the builds for the 30 to 80% AMI? The average household income in this neighborhood is $28,072. The average per capita income is $17,711. No one in that income range could ever afford to live in any of these luxury apartment housing complexes. And as we continue to build them at these alarming rates, we're just going to further displace the residents that have lived in this neighborhood for decades and push them further and further away from the city. Again, an issue of gentrification. We have an excess of luxury housing and I beg and urge you to not support the rezoning of this property due to the deficit of affordable housing and the need for affordable housing. This property will also deplete all the parking in the area. So the residents that are currently living there, not only will the rents go up, they won't have places to park, people's property taxes will increase and people will lose their homes and it's not right. Um, we can't let de developers continue to run our city so that they can continue to profit. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Oh, one, one more thing. I do question the vote of the area commission meeting as they are supposed to have 17 members and only six voted on this property. Only three for the property. That's a concerning number to me and I really question um, the recommendation that they made based off those numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bliss. Do any of my colleagues uh, have any questions for Ms. Bliss? Seeing none, thank you again. Uh, next speaker we have to come before council is Mr. Uh, Dana Masoner. Sir, welcome back to council. As you well know, you've got three minutes and uh, let us know if there's any uh, organization you represent. Okay. Hello, council, council president. Dana Masoner, vice president of the Bronzeville Neighborhood Association. 
And the DEAL project is helping build back the historic character of this neighborhood. If we go back to the 1880s, 1890s, up through 1920, Long Street was a happening place. You had the Park Hotel, you had the Empress Theater across from the Lincoln, the Lincoln Theater. Going down the street, you had apartments going down Long Street all the way into downtown. You had so many people going up and down the street. Then we lost all that in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. We are now getting that back. Thanks to Kathleen Bailey, Near East Area Commission, myself, Willis Brown, when we were on the commission, we walked Long Street back in 2005, 2007, helped put the current award-winning Near East Area plan together that put the things in place to make this kind of a project a possibility in the future. We're now seeing that possibility come together. We have all kinds of housing in our neighborhood. We have workforce housing on Atchison. We have other projects. We have another project that the current developer for this one, Kelly, is doing by Shiloh Baptist that has affordable units in it. And all the projects that are going in have to have a percentage of affordable units in them. But you need units to pay for affordable units. We want everybody. We have everybody in our community. We're excited about this project. In addition to this project, like the current speaker spoke about, we have the Ogden. With the Ogden, with the Adelphi, with this project, with the activities in the Lincoln, we're looking forward to the parking garage across from the Lincoln Theater. This project makes that even more viable. You, the city, own the land, so we can do that. So the parking will be dealt with, has been dealt with, in the Near East Side. So Kelly is doing fantastic things on the Near East Side with the Baptist Convention project over by East High School, like I said, by Shiloh, like this project. This project is a special project. It is the gateway. It will say Bronzeville on it. We will get recognition for the neighborhood. We are looking forward to it. We've had numerous meetings in the Bronzeville Neighborhood Association with this project, with the attorney, with the developer, Kelly, came to our meetings. We had the opportunity for anybody to ask any questions. And we had no time limit. Many questions were asked. We approved the project. We went through the commission went through the planning, the zoning. There's numerous discussions. Numerous flyers were sent around the neighborhood. It was broadcast through our live feed of our committee, our, our Bronzeville Neighborhood Association meetings. So everybody's known about it. Everybody's had an opportunity to participate in the process. So here we are at the final hurdle, and we're looking forward to your approval. And uh, like I've said previously, this community, and particularly this stretch of Long Street, is like a Swiss watch. Everything works together. One project helps feed another project, helps feed another project. So with this project, we have a just to get pedestrian the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do my colleagues have any questions? Thank you, Dana, for being here. Uh, the final speaker we have before us this evening on this uh, piece of legislation is Mr. Willis Brown. Mr. Brown? Welcome back to council. And the floor is yours, sir. Good evening, Council President Harding and council members and staff. Uh, this, is, this is exciting because we spent a lot of time here 20 years ago saying that this time will come in this here now for all development. We want section eight, we want six figures, and we always hear that every time we put something to raise the, pre the presentation or the appearance of the Near East Side or the King Lincoln District, or, and specifically Bronzeville, it is, we don't want to have luxury apartments. We don't want this. We're going to push people out. Those who are there, if they have their house, they can apply for the Homestead Act to keep that they're not taxed out. And what people should do is spend time at this place, come here and sit down for three hours on the bench. You have cushions now and see what's going on. And that's what we have done. We've been predicting and planning for this, as, as Dana said earlier. We have affordable housing. We want the, the, the whole gamut. We, don't, we are one square mile in Bronzeville, and we, we have all this going on. We also have it, another asset. All those that are saying that this is a, not the right thing should all rally and visit all the black churches in our area that have land. The churches can build land. If they're not building, then they're not doing their service. 
So we need both. The churches can build affordable and market rate because they have three and four blocks of empty land. So this is how you have to do both. The chicken comes before the egg or the egg comes before the chicken. They must come together. And this is where we're saying today, this is the beginning. We're going to have enough for everyone because the neighborhood has the capacity. And the people are crying about this. This is just the ice, this is just the, 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 the appetizer. Watch when the north side of Bronzeville gets developed, which is on Old Leonard, by the, by the, um, the hospital, the, the, the clinic. That's coming. And so this is, our area is going to be the viable area, parallel to 670. All that's yet to come. We are sitting on the diamonds, the gold, the plutonium. And we would like to say in Bronzeville, it is not for everyone. It's only for those who want to be a part of something great. And we are the ones making it great. So we must have apartments up here. We must have townhomes up here. We must have those down here. And, and the Kelly Project with Shiloh is an example of affordable housing that's coming in. He made it clear at our meeting, if you have a voucher, you can come to his apartment and get a unit. And we're making sure that that's the case in, 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 in the new development that you have. So we are cognizant of what the parameters are. But we, we also had asked for other things. But this is the beginning. The Adelphi is a true testament. Yes, the people are moving in and out. It's an apartment. They have a lease. But that, people said that that building and that caliber of building should not be there. Because when you keep doing that, you say that the neighborhood can only operate at substandard. Why can Granville have these things? Why can other communities have all these nice buildings? Why we always have to turn the other cheek and say, we must stay in a poverty looking state. We want to raise everyone from the bottom up. So when, when the tide comes in, we can release ourselves and go up like everyone else and not always be hit with the hammer of we have to have things that at that level. We want it for all and we improve the quality of life for everyone as we can, like street lights and traffic calming devices and all these things, we're gonna add to that. So again, thank you and we are continue to be pushing forward for the whole community of Bronzeville. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Brown. Do my colleagues have any questions for Mr. Brown? Councilmember Bank Bankson. No, nope, not a question. I just want to make sure I, I say this. Um, being a product of the Near East Side, um, and Mr. Willis Brown would come to my stoop and advocate for the community. And so I just wanted to make sure I said to you, Mr. Uh, Brown, to Dana and Ms. Bailey, for your decades of fighting for this. Uh, and you all were intentional from the beginning to make sure that there was affordability, but even more intentional to make sure that it was quality. Uh, and that's what we're getting here. And so I just wanted to thank you for your years of advocacy. Thank you. We want appropriate, sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, do any of my colleagues have any questions for the applicant after that public testimony? Uh, seeing none, um, at this point, based on the approval from the recommending bodies, um, neighborhood support, uh, obviously we can't solve every uh, issue associated with the development with a zoning or a variance. There is a number of housing issues that are related, um, many of which um, Chair Favor is, is grappling with every single week that this council is grappling with every single week. But a single rezoning or variance is, is not um, where that work always happens. Um, so with that, um, if you know, my colleagues have any questions or comments at this point, I would move for passage by voice vote. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston. Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla. Ms. Brown. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Favor. Abstain. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Ordinance 1942-2022 to rezone 2400 Old Dublin Road being 69.99 plus acres located in the northeast side of Old Dublin Road, 600 plus feet north of Dublin Road from the M Manufacturing District to R3 Residential District, AR3 Apartment Residential District, and CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is Thrive Companies Care of Dave Perry Agent. Proposed use of the mixed use development. City's Department recommendation is approval. Development Commission's recommendation is approval 6-0. The West Scioto Area Commission recommendation is approval 7-0. Uh, do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Amend it. Thank you. I now move for passage as amended. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass.
Thank you. Next, we have uh, Ordinance 1944-2022 to rezone 3136 Treby Road, being 9.22 plus acres located in the northeast, northeast side of Treby Road and Dublin Road, from a man manufacturing district to AR1 apartment residential district. And the applicant is Thrive Companies, care of Dave Perry Agent, proposed use of a multi-unit residential development. The city's department recommendation is approval. The development commission's recommendation is approval 60. West Sayota Area Commission recommendation is approval 80. No, my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Horton. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1956 2022 to rezone uh, 5900 Shannon Road, being 30.44 acres located on the northeast side of Shannon Road, 775 plus feet west of Bryce Road from our, our rural district to PUD 8 plan unit development. Um, the, ap the applicant is Richard J. Connie Company, care of Dave Perry Agent. Proposed use is a residential development. City's Department rec recommendation is approval. Development Commission's recommendation is approval 5 1. Greater Southeast Area Commission's recommendation is approval 5 1. Do I my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1966 2022 to rezone 777 Neal Avenue being 5.03 plus acres located in the southwest corner of Neal Avenue and Buttles Avenue from C3 Commercial District to AR3 Apartment Residential District and CPD Commercial Plan Development District. Uh, the applicant is SC Thurber Village uh, Limited, care of uh, Eric Leibowitz, agent. Proposed use is a commercial development, multi-unit residential developments. C's department recommendation is approval. The Development Commission's recommendation is approval 6-0. Uh, Harrison West uh, Society's recommendation is approval 5-0, or I'm sorry, 5-1. Uh, we do have one uh, public speaker to sign up to speak against this ordinance. So at this point, I will ask for a staff presentation from Ms. Pine. The site consists of one parcel developed with a retail shopping center and parking lot in the C3 commercial district. The requested AR3 apartment residential district will permit a multi-unit residential development, and the requested CPD commercial plan development will permit a commercial development with two commercial buildings, uh, being 15,500 square feet and 22,500 square feet. The CPD text commits to a site plan, permits C3 commercial district uses, and includes development standards addressing setbacks, access, parking, landscaping, building design, lighting, and graphics commitments. Modifications to code standards for landscaping and screening, parking setback line, minimum numbers of parking and loading spaces required, screening, and C3 district setback lines are included in this request. While there is no adopted land use pl plan in place at this location, Columbus Citywide Planning Policies design guidelines apply to the site and call for high quality building materials, landscaping between residential and non-residential uses, enhanced aesthetic appeal, and bicycle parking. The requested AR3 apartment residential district and CPD commercial plan development districts will allow mixed use development that is consistent with C2P2 design guidelines and the established development pattern of the neighborhood. The request is consistent with the recent development, recent redevelopment proposals of shopping centers in urban areas. A concurrent council variance has been filed for the AR3 apartment residential district portion of the site, which commits to a site plan. Uh, I'm sorry, it does not commit to a site plan. It commits, it, well, it commits to a maximum of 230 dwelling units and variances to permit the use of the structured parking in the AR3 portion of the site to be used in the commercial plan development district and to reduce the driveway width landscaping and screening, parking setback line, minimum number of parking spaces required, building lines and rear yard are included in the request along with some uh, the temporary use of a commercial building. Uh, City Department's recommendation is for approval and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fine. Do my colleagues have any questions for the department at this point? Thank you. Seeing none, I, I would ask for the applicant um, to come forward and make a presentation. Mr. Leibowitz. Good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Leibowitz. I'm Vice President of Development and Leasing at Casto. Thrilled to be here this evening. Uh, President Hardin, Chair Dorans, and members of council, thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. Uh, I'll just make a couple quick points uh, since it's been a, a long road to get here. 
this has been a truly collaborative effort. Uh, it's been more than two years of work from a lot of people in our building, uh, Mr. Perry, uh, Harrison, Harrison West Society and surrounding communities, city staff as well. Uh, that support and input from Harrison West and the other communities uh, and the city staff has, has resulted in what we feel is a truly transformational project for what's a really important piece of real estate in Columbus and within our portfolio. Uh, we take a great deal of pride in the fact that we have support and approval from Harrison West Development Commission, Graphics Commission, and that city staff has supported our application. And what we feel the end result here is a really dynamic project uh, that reflects monumental effort over a period of multiple years to get to this point. So I'm um, happy to answer any questions, but just want to thank you, city staff, and the collaboration from the neighborhood and all parties throughout this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lee. But do any of my colleagues have any questions at this point of the applicant? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you want to pause and see if there's any representatives from the Harrison West Society here with us tonight that would like to speak on this? I'm not seeing anybody. Um, we do have one... Uh, speakers uh, signed up to speak on this ordinance, uh, Mr. Todd Law. Mr. Law, please come to the podium. Uh, you have three minutes, and please let us know if you're representing any organization. Good evening. Make sure you got this right. Uh, I'm Todd Law, and for the last 25 years, I've lived at 744 Neal Avenue right across the street from this project we're discussing tonight. I'm not fond of the current strip mall there, and this new project is just a different strip mall that when it could be so much more. The historic homes that were destroyed long before this area uh, was made a federally protected historic neighborhood, that's the damage is done. But now that it's a protected neighborhood, we must take care to make sure that it can keep the neighborhood intact. And building a pair of single-story commercial buildings right up against Neal Avenue was not helping with that. When this plan was revealed in February, I asked why they could not build apartments above the two commercial buildings, and they are told that CVS does not want to share their surface parking lot with anybody. Hmm. And I explained that underground lots could easily handle the parking for the apartments and leave the surface lot for CVS customers, but my request was ignored. The next day at the Short North Civic Association meeting, some of the Victorian Village Historic Review Commissioners told us that on that same day, the University Commission had approved replacing the CVS at Landon High with a 12-story building and a CVS underneath. So they will share their parking lot if OSU tells them to, but they won't listen to us. So uh, since uh, the February meeting, I was also informed that I got 100, anybody within 125 feet, which is me, gets notified. Well, we were not notified about a lot of these meetings, including the Development Committee meeting in April. I, since I got my notice for this meeting, I checked with my neighbors, some of which are here tonight, and a lot of people did not, about a dozen people did not get notified of this one, the April meeting, or the graphics meeting last Tuesday. So, when they uh, approved it in April, we'd already, uh, my neighbors had agreed to go talk to them about uh, trying to make this change, and. Uh, we just found it hard to believe that any developer in the short north would say, no, we don't want to build a bigger building. We want a one-story building. It just hasn't happened. And so adding these apartments, when they're already going to add 230-some-odd to the same block, is not a burden to them. It would make it more appropriate in size and look and materials to the surrounding neighborhood, because it's surrounded on two sides by Victorian Village, and Victorian Village did not get a vote on this, just to be clear. And we were shut out from the legal process that we were supposed to be part of. So giving them a bigger customer base, the developers want to make more money off of more apartments, and it helps the historic neighborhood is a win-win-win for everybody. This plan currently as it stands is not a win for everybody. Mixed use has uh, been the best tool for revitalizing the Short North, the Arena District, and the Columbus Commons into places that people want to live. And making these mixed use, individual mixed use buildings, would go a long way to improving that. This is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to get this right. Because we've had a strip mall there since, what, the 60s? That should probably not have been there, but it was before the historic district. I see And now we're getting impacted again because technically that's on the other side of the street. 
and we were shut out of this process, and that's just fraud. Thank you, Mr. Law. Do any of my colleagues have any questions for Mr. Law? Thank you. One of the things I wanted to follow up when Mr. Law was talking about being shut out, so the um, Victorian Village Architectural Review Commission is their boundaries stop right there. So the, the project development, so when he's talking about, you know, not having that architectural review of it, it's because the, the applicant site right here is directly next to it. So um, certainly un understand the frustrations of not having that involved here. Um, but, you know, that, that's sort of where, where those boundaries that... I understand that, but when they built 670, that was the first time they ever ran a interstate off-ramp through a federally protected historic mm -hmm. neighborhood. And I was on the uh, neighborhood committee that worked on that for close to a decade to get that right yeah. and impact and minimize the impact of the uh, traffic through the neighborhood. Yeah. And so this abuts a historic district. The historic district has to be protected. And I see no efforts in this building to do that. They change it from stucco to brick, but it looks just like every other CVS ever built anywhere in the world. It could look like our neighborhood. It could be the same height as our neighborhood. And nobody would get hurt. They would make more money. I don't understand why that is a problem. Thank you, Mr. Law. Um, any, any other follow-up questions from council members? Thank you. Uh, I am gonna ask the applicant to, to come back to address this, this issue regarding the CVS. In terms of the CVS, the building or the so one of the layout? things I've heard, yeah, one of the things I've heard as we as this has sort of moved its way through the process is mm -hmm. that sticking point about um, you know sort of the existing agreement with the CVS that's on the property it has limited some of the neighborhood feedback, which I think Mr. Law is expressing some of that frustration now, and I'm, you know, council sort of gets caught in the middle between what you know the contractual obligations of the applicant are versus what the neighborhood wants to see, and I just want to give the you you as the applicant sort of an opportunity to sort of clear the air a little bit Absolutely. about I what, when, and why. Appreciate that chair Dorns very much uh, uh, no commercial project no mixed-use project unfortunately is a blank slate and we wish that were the case here we do have uh, an existing tenant in CVS that has multiple years of lease term left as part of this opportunity to execute and bring uh, some new amenities back to the this neighborhood which had been vacant in the shopping center uh, there were some conditions that came with that. And in, uh, Mr. Law refers, uh, references a project at, at Lane and High. Unfortunately, I can't speak to that agreement. I can only speak to certain parts of our agreement. And in order to satisfy certain conditions that came with uh, executing this development now, uh, that included uh, keeping both a single tenant building at Buttles and Neal and a single tenant building at uh, Buttles and Collins, or I'm sorry, Neil and Collins. And what we've done uh, to, is work with Harrison West and actually the Short North Alliance and other neighborhood communities took part, including Mr. Law in a February meeting. He raised some very good questions on traffic as part of the February meeting, which we addressed and talked about. Uh, but I will tell you, we have worked f very, very hard for a period of years to take into account uh, many, many questions and concerns from the neighborhood. Unfortunately, we cannot please everyone. We've gotten to a what we feel is a transformational project. Uh, and in terms of the, uh, the, the CVS requirements, there are certain things that come with that. And uh, from a building perspective and design perspective, what, we, uh, what will be put forth there, we think will be a, a great fit. We know that everyone may not agree with that, but in general, uh, we've worked very hard to, to make sure that we're squared away and, and can make urbanize this, create density that, that fits within the neighborhood and it brings uh, amenities that have been lacking. Thank you. Any questions from council members? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, certainly understand some of the comments from, from Mr. Law tonight about that frustration around how that potential aspect of development will fit in with, with the neighborhood. Um, however, again, understanding sort of holistically what, what this project details um, and given the approval from the Harrison West Society and certainly other recommending bodies at this point, uh, unless my colleagues have any questions or comments at this point, I'd like to move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Horton. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 2082-2022 to rezone 190, uh, 
1930 Hard Road being 1.2 acres located at the northeast side of Hard Road and Smoky Row Road from C4 Commercial District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. And the applicant is United Dairy Farmers, Inc. Care of Rebecca, um, Care of Rebecca Mott, attorney. Proposed use of a fuel sales facility with convenience retail. Seas Department recommendation is approval. Development Commission's recommendation is approval. So far Northwest uh, Coalition's recommendation is 2-0. Two, um, at the request of the applicant, I move to table this ordinance indefinitely. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Sadi Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Table. Thank you. Next, we have ordinance 2093-2022 to rezone um, 1500 Enbright Road being 36.16 uh, acres located on the east side of Enbright Road, 1,680 plus feet south of Winchester Pike from the NC Neighborhood Center District to NG Neighborhood General District and the NEE Neighborhood Edge District to LARLD Limited Apartment Residential District, LR2 Limited Residential District. The applicant is Palmave LLC, care of Jackson Reynolds Attorney, proposed use as a multi and single unit residential development. C's Department's recommendation is approval. Development Commission's recommendation is approval 321. Um, the Greater Southeast Area Commission's recommendation is approval 81. Uh, do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next, we have ordinance 2106 2022 to rezone 1235 Oak Street. Uh, being 0.77 plus acres located the south side of Oak Street, 35 plus feet uh, west of Wilson Road from ALRLD Apartment Residential Residential District and LP1 Limited Private Parking District to AR3 res, Apartment Residential District. Uh, the applicant is Juliet Bull, uh, Bullock. The proposed use of a multi-unit residential development. City's Department recommendation is approval. Development Commission's recommendation is approval. Near East Area Commission's rec recommendation is approval. 421. Uh, do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I first move to add uh, to move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Clerk, clerk please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Amended. Thank you. I now move for passage as amended. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. We'll now move in the council variance part uh, of the of the agenda. Next, we have variance uh, 1688-2022 to grant variance provisions of section 3363.01 and manufacturing districts 3309.14, height district 3312.11, uh, drive drive ups, setback area 3312.21, landscaping and screening 3312.27, parking setback lines 3312.49B, minimum number of parking spaces required 3312.51, loading space 3356.05E2. Uh, C4 district development limitations and 3363.24 building lines and an M manufacturing district of the Columbus City Coast, the property located at 1445 Old Tangy River Road to permit an extended state uh, hotel with reduced development standards in the M manufacturing district. Um, the applicant is Campus Hotel LLC, care of Jeff Brown Attorney, proposed use as a hotel and extended stay hotel. City's Department recommendation is approval. The 5th by Northwest Area Commission's recommendation is disapproval 4-3. Um, due to a disapproval from the Air Commission, I will now ask Ms. Pine for a staff presentation. This site consists of one parcel in the M Manufacturing District that is developed with two hotels, one fronting on King Avenue and one fronting on Olentangy River Road. The requested variance will allow the King Avenue Hotel to be redeveloped with a 117-room extended stay hotel, which is now a prohibited use of the M District. The 55-room hotel that fronts on Olentangy River Road will remain, and an existing 300-square-foot drive through window connected to the hotel, which is used for checking in and out, will be repurposed to include guest food service. Variances are included to increase building height, eliminate a bypass lane and stacking for the drive through reduce the landscaping and screening requirements, reduce the parking setback line on King Avenue from 10 feet to 0 feet, reduce the minimum number of parking spaces from 176 required to 97 provided, permit the loading space to be located in a drive aisle, and reduce the building setback along King Avenue. This site is within the planning boundaries of the 5th by Northwest Area Plan, which recommends community commercial land uses for this location. The community commercial land use designation includes multi-story mixed-use projects, including office retail and multi-unit residential development, which is consistent with the proposed extended stay hotel. Additionally, the plan includes early adoption of the Columbus Citywide Planning Policies Design Guidelines, which recommends that buildings be parallel to and facing the street, 
landscaping and street trees be provided, high quality and durable materials be utilized, and any drive-through pickup windows be located to the rear or side of the building. Additionally, the plan states that parking be located behind or to the side of the building, that bicycle parking be provided, and that parking variances be considered based on access to public transit, pedestrian connectivity, and the provision of bicycle parking. The proposal is consistent with the land use and design guidelines of the plan and C2P2 guidelines, does not add a new or intrusive use to the neighborhood, and is compatible with the recent development pattern in the area. Staff notes that the existing parcel has a parking easement across adjacent parcels and allows 51 shared parking, shared parking spaces, further justifying the requested parking variance. Therefore, the city department's recommendation is for approval. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pine. Do my colleagues have any questions of the department? Seeing none, since we have disapproval, I'd ask for a presentation by the, the applicant. Mr. Brown? You do. Let me give that to that. Um, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth and nothing but the truth as you shall answer in the pains or penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. I do. Thank you, Mr. Brown. The floor is yours. Um, I'm Jeffrey L. Brown, attorney for the applicant, uh, President Hardin, zoning chair, Dorn, um, council members. Uh, my client is in the hotel business. Uh, they built the Aloft building uh, next to uh, Cap City down on Olentangy River Road. Uh, they also have built three new hotels further up on Olentangy where they took old tired properties and built brand new buildings uh, which had better occupancy, better room rate, uh, better for the whole area. Their corporate offices are a block away from this building. So our proposal is to take this L-shaped property that has frontage both on King Avenue and Olentangy and be able to split into two separate tax parcels. The Varsity Inn, which fronts on Olentangy, will be renovated. The old Cross Country Inn that's on King Avenue will be demolished and replaced by an extended stay <laughs> hotel. That is actually an extended stay hotel, not an apartment development. Uh, Home Two Suites uh, is the tenant for that building. We worked with staff, we worked with the, the zoning committee for the area commission, which recommended approval. I honestly don't know what happened at the full commission uh, in terms of their uh, three, four vote, uh, but the zoning committee did recommend a, approval of it. And as you heard from the staff report, this is an appropriate use uh, and staff supports the request. So it's a chance to revive, revitalize a tired old property, I put a brand new extended stay on it, and if you know this location, I'm surrounded to the west by the railroad tracks, King Avenue, uh, Tim Hortons, Wendy's, Bob Evans, and Olentangy River Road. So I believe this is an appropriate location for this type of use, uh, and with the reduction in development standards uh, would allow this renovation to occur. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Brown. Just to, again, underline the point, essentially what, what is the, the variance is allowing here is several things associated with the redevelopment uh, or renovation of an existing hotel, so no change in use, and then a demolishing and then rebuilding of another hotel facility that's right. currently if, there. If, if, if we were doing a regular hotel, then we would not have a use issue. We would have gone to the BZA with the development standards. Obviously, those properties were built at a time where uh, the standards that we have weren't applicable. So we're dealing with an existing site that can't get bigger because of the railroad tracks and the surrounding development. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Brown? Seeing none, thank you. Um, as I mentioned, this did have disapproval from the 5th by Northwest Area Commission, but we've been in contact with the zoning chair and other folks um, based on the issues that they identified based on the, the use that, the consistent use that exists here, uh, I'm comfortable moving this forward. So at this point, unless any of my colleagues have any questions or comments, I'd like to move to accept the entire staff report and new evidence as an exhibit. I'm like, well, allow me to pause there. Council Member Favor. Apologies, I, I just wanted to be clear on what the, what feedback did you receive from the commission? So the zoning, yes. yeah, the zoning chair, so the zoning committee had passed, passed mm -hmm. it. When, um, the zoning chair, uh, again, mentioned to us that uh, they were un unclear about sort of why this got bogged down at, at the Air Commission itself. We've done outreach. Um, we have not at this point had any significant feedback from them other than the zoning chair saying that they supported the project and the zoning uh, committee supported the project. Okay, thank you. 
Any other questions from members? Seeing none, I move to ex accept the entire staff report and new evidence as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Accept it. I move to adopt the finding of staff as the finance of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Adopt it. And finally, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. <coughs> Passed. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, variance 1907 2022 to grant advanced provisions of section 3332.035 R3, R3 permitted uses 3312.49 minimum number of parking spaces required and 3332.05 area district lot width requirements to Columbus City Codes for the property located at 1697 1699 East Long Street to permit a uh, three unit dwelling to reduce development standards in the R3 residential district. The applicant is uh, Imagination LLC. Um, care of Jonathan Liu, trustee. The proposed use is a three-unit dwelling. City's department recommendation is approval. Near East Area Commission's recommendation is approval. Do I have my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I first move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit by voice. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Abstain. Ms. Taremi? President Hardin? Yes, accept it. Thank you. I now move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council by voice. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorrance? Yes. Ms. Favor? Abstain. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Hardin? Yes. Next, I move to amend as submitted to the clerk by voice. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorrance? Yes. Ms. Favor? Abstain. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Hardin? Yes. Amended. Thank you. I now move uh, for passage as amended by voice. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorrance? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have a variance 1943-2022 to grant a variance uh, provisions of section 3333.03 AR3 apartment residential district use 3312.09 IL 3312.21A landscaping and screening 3312.25 maneuvering 3312.29 parking space 3312.49 C MIM number of parking spaces required 3332.05 Area district lot width requirements 3332.13 R3 area district requirements 3332.19 fronting 3332.27 rear yard 3333.16 uh, fronting um, 3333.24 rear yard 3333.255 perimeter yard of the Columbus City Coast so the property located at 2400 Old Dublin Road to permit shared use parking at community center uh, as a principal use commercial uses and reduced development standards for a mixed use development in the R3 res res residential district and AR3 apartment residential district. Uh, the applicant is Thrive Companies care of Dave Perry agent proposed use of a mixed use development. City's department recommendation is approval. West Iota Area Commission's recommendation is approval 8-0. Uh, first, I move to accept the entire staff reports into evidence as, as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Accept it. Thank you. I now move to adopt the finance of staff as the finance of council. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. Thank you. I next uh, amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Amended. Thank you. Uh, finally, I move for passage as amended. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. We next have uh, variance 1945 2022 to grant advance provisions of section 3333.02 AR12, ARLD, and AR1 apartment residential district. Uh, uses 3309.14B height district, 3312.29 parking spaces, 3312.49C minimum number of parking spaces acquired, 3333.18 building lines, and 3333.255 perimeter yard of Columbus City Coast, a property located at 3136 Freeview Road, to permit a commercial vehicular access and reduce development standards for apartment complex in the AR1 apartment residential district. The applicant is Thrive uh, Companies, care of Day Perry Agent, pros use the multi unit residential development. C's department recommendation is approval. Uh, West Side Area Commission's recommendation is approval 8 0. Um, first, I move to accept the entire staff report and new evidence as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the roll. 
Bankston, Burroughs, Sadi Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harding. Accept it. Thank you. I next move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Sadi Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harding. Adopt it. Thank you. Now I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Sadi Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harding. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have uh, variance 1955 2022 to grant uh, variance provisions of section 3356.03, C4 permitted uses, 3312.25 maneuvering, 3312.29 parking spaces, 3312.49C, minimum number of parking spaces required, 3321.05B1, vision clearance, 3325.213B. Uh, FAR standards, 3325.223 building height standard, 3325.241D uh, uh, building design standards, 3356.05F2 C4 uh, development district limitations of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at uh, 200 East 5th Avenue to permit a mixed use uh, development with reduced development standards of the C4 commercial district. And the applicant is Likens Companies, uh, care of Dave Perry agent, proposed use and mixed use development. Cities Department recommendations approval. University Area Commission's recommendation is approval 1301. At the request of the applicant, I move to table this legislation indefinitely. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barroso de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harton. Table. Thank you. Next, we have variance 1967-2022 to grant a variance from provisions of section 3333.03 AR3 apartment residential district use, 3312.13 driveway, 3312.21A landscaping and screening, 3312.27 parking setback line, 3312.49 minimum number of parking spaces required, 3333.18 building lines, 3333.24 rear yard of, of uh, Columbus City Codes for prop property located at 777 Neal Avenue to permit commercial parking spaces and re reduce development standards for a multi-unit residential development in the AR3 apartment residential district. Uh, the applicant is SC Thurber Village Limited, care of er Eric Leibowitz agent, proposed uses that reduce development standards for a multi-unit uh, residential development. State Department recommendation is approval. Harrison West uh, Society's recommendation is approval 6-2. Um, I move to accept the entire staff report and new evidence as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barroso, Sadi Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Accept it. I next move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barroso, Sadi Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. Finally, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barroso de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Um, next, we have variance 2052 2022 to grant a variance, from provi variance provisions of section 3332.029, suburban residential district, and 3312.49, minimum number of parking spaces required of the Columbus City Codes, located for the property located at 6158 North Gap Drive to permit a Type A home duty uh, daycare facility with reduced parking in the SR suburban residential district. Uh, the applicant is Notoria uh, Goff. The proposed use is a type A home facility within a single home, home daycare facility, I'm sorry, with a single unit dwelling. City's department recommendation is approval and the Northland Community Council's recommendation is approval 13 0 Do I have my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move to ex and, uh, accept the entire staff report and do evidence as an exhibit. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Sadi Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Accept it. Uh, next, I move to adopt the uh, findings of staff as the findings of council. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Sadi Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. And finally, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Sadi Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Finally, we have uh, variance 2101-2022 to grant a variance provisions of section 3332.037 R2F, residential district 3356.03 C4 permitted uses, 3309.14 height districts, 3312.21 A2 landscaping and screening, 3312.49 AC, minimum number of parking spaces required, 3356.05 F, C4 district development limitations, and 3356.11 C4 for district setback lines, the Columbus City Codes, the property located at 459 East Livingston Avenue to permit a mixed use uh, development with reduced development standards in the C4 commercial, resi commercial district with an R2F residential district. 
the applicant is North Star Realty. Care of Michael Shannon, attorney. Proposed use is a mixed-use development. Seas Department recommendation is approval. Columbus uh, Southside Air Commission recommendation is approval 11 uh, We did have one speaker signed up to speak in opposition to this ordinance uh, tonight. However, that individual has withdrawn their speaker slip after conversations with council staff and the applicant. Uh, so appreciate the applicant um, and council staff working with that individual to address their concerns. Thus, we will not have a um, presentation from staff and I will pause to see if my colleagues have any questions or comments. Seeing none, I move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Accept it. Next, I move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Adopt it. I now move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have uh, variance 2107-2022 to grant a variance provisions of section 3333.0 the AR3 apartment residential district uses, 3321.01A dumpster area, 3312.49 minimum number parking spaces required, 3333.18 building lines, and 3333.255 perimeter yard, the Columbus City Codes, for the property located at 1235 Oak Street to permit a single unit dwelling and reduced development standards for apartment complex in the AR3 apartment residential district. The applicant <coughs> is Julia Bullock. Um, the proposed use is a mixed use residential development. Seize apartment recommendation is approval. Near East Air Commission's recommendation is approval 421. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Accept it. I next move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Adopt it. Next, I move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Amended. And finally, I move for passage as amended. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Adopted. And finally, we have variance 2111-2022 to grant a variance provisions of section 3332.037A, R2F, Residential District, 3332.14, R2F, Area District Requirements, and 3312.49B, minimum number of parking spaces required of the Columbus City Coast, the property located at 360 Jackson Street, to permit a three-unit dwelling in R2F uh, Residential District. The applicant is 360 Jackson LLC, care of Jackson B. Reynolds Attorney, proposed use of a three-unit three dwelling, seats department recommendation the approval of the German Village Area Commission recommendation is approval. Uh, uh, first, I move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Adipa, Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Accept it. Next, I move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Adipa, Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Adopt it. And finally, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Adi Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you, Council President. That's all we have in the zoning committee this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there any, seeing no further business come for the zoning committee, is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Adi Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Meeting is adjourned. We'll, re we'll reconvene a regular meeting in 10 minutes.
you, uh, President Hart. We just have uh, one item in technology committee this evening. I'd like to go back to page five of our agenda for first reading. Uh, we have ordinance 1219-2022 to authorize the director of the Department of Technology for various departments to enter into contract with vCloud Tech Inc. for annual software support and maintenance for net motion software licenses to authorize the expenditure of $82,767 from the Department of Technology Information Services Operating Fund. If, are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I first move to waive second reading. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. I now move for passage. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you, Council President. That's all I have in my committees this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next committee to come before council is the Neighborhoods Committee. The committee is chaired by council member, what committee is it? Public Service and Transportation. Service and Transportation chaired by council member Rosa de Padilla, council member Flores Joris. I do chair the other one. We're going to start with this one. Um, so tonight in Public Service and Transportation, I have uh, two ordinances. Uh, the first is 20... 9-9-2022 to authorize the transfer of funds and appropriation between projects within the streets and highways bond fund to authorize the director of public service to enter into a contract modification with Strasser Paving Company in connection with the resurfacing 2021 project to authorize the expenditure of up to $1,174,840.73 from the streets and highways bond fund and to declare an emergency. The Vision Zero Columbus Action Plan 1.0 is a citywide plan to begin to eliminate fatal and serious injury crashes on city streets. In 2021, our resurfacing project one consisted of repairing and resurfacing 84 city streets and constructing 433 ADA curb ramps along these streets. This specific ordinance is to modify and authorize, um, or I'm sorry, authorizes modification of the resurfacing 2021 Project 1 to uh, implement Vision Zero safety improvements for Livingston Avenue from College Avenue to James Road and other such work as may be necessary. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, okay. please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Adi Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, <coughs> President Pardon. Great. Pass. Thank you. So we, I'd like to go back to first read ordinance 2141-2022 on page five. So this ordinance is to authorize the director of the Department of Public Service to execute these document, those documents necessary for the city to grant Edwards Company's encroachment easement along Gay East Gay Street. So this project is a permanent aerial sculptural net that will remain above the roadway from approximately April to November within the public right of way above the intersection of Gay Street and High Street. So this ordinance will allow the city to grant this encroachment to legally allow this item within the public right of ways. Uh, questions, comments? Great. I move for to waive second reading. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Adi, Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Waived. And now I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Be on the Pass. lookout for the spidey net near you soon. Okay, uh, may I move to my next committee? Please. Thank you. I have three ordinances today in Neighborhoods, Immigrant, Refugee, and Migrant Affairs. 2170-2022 to authorize the Director of the Department of Neighborhoods to modify the Communi Community Development Block Grant CDBG, Mid-Ohio Food Collective, Wheatland Farm Market Building Construction Subaward Agreement to increase CDBG funding support by $3 million and to amend the subawards budget and project schedules to authorize a transfer of $723,133 from the city's revolving loan fund to the city's community development block grant fund and to authorize the appropriation of anticipated program income and CDBG funding from Community Development Block Grant Fund in the amount of $776,000 and 
$67 to authorize the expenditure of $3 million from the De Community Development Block Grants Fund and to declare an emergency. The Mid-Ohio Food Collective Wheatland Farm Project located at 116 North Wheatland Avenue is transforming a land bank property in the hilltop into a farm and neighborhood facility providing education opportunities and healthy food options to low and moderate income families. This specific ordinance helps to increase city funding support as well as revive, revise the agreement schedule and budget. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Borough, City, Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. 2182-2022 to authorize the city clerk to enter into a grant agreement with Motherful in support of resources for single mothers, to authorize an appropriation and expenditure within the neighborhood initiative subfund, and to declare an emergency. Founded in 2018 by three single mothers, Motherful seeks to bridge the gaps experienced by single mothers and their children. Motherful was born from a desire to create an organization that would provide a respite of community for single mothers and their children, where they would be understood and supported both emotionally and physically. These funds will support single mothers in many categories ranging from rent, utilities, transportation, food, clothing, and legal assistance. Here today, very patiently, we've had waiting with us Cherie Hampton, Motherful's President of the Board of Directors and Collective Care Coordinator, and Lisa Woodward, Co-Founder, Co-Director, here to tell us a bit about their organization. So Cherie and Lisa, if you want to come to the podium. Good evening, Council President Hardin and fellow council members. My name is Cherie Hampton, and I am the president of the Board of Directors and Collective Care Coordinator for Motherful. I'm Lisa Woodward, the co-founder and co-director of Motherful. I'm Naima Campbell, and I serve as the secretary of Motherful. First, I want to thank uh, Councilwoman Barossa de Padilla for meeting with us and helping us with uh, this $6,200. Motherful is a collective of single moms and we provide support, resources, community, and empowerment for them. We operate a resource pantry and a 15-bed community garden. And through a partnership with Trader Joe's, we receive meat and produce every day from both locations. So our moms have access to food security and also uh, we teach them about composting and we also provide them with assistance for emergency expenses such as our emergency fund program which your $6,200 is going to fund for those unexpected emergencies like to stave off a utility disconnection mm -hmm. or an eviction for car repairs for prescriptions or medical expenses or anything a mom might need to help her out because we're a lifeline for these families that we serve we are also on the front lines with other local orgs such as ohio women's alliance uh urge and we are standing up for the rights of all mothers, for the reproductive rights of mothers, for voter education and awareness in our single mom community, as well as climate justice for our single moms. We want to empower them and give them the support that they need so they can live easier lives and focus on things besides raising their children because that's a full-time job, but these moms also have hopes and dreams of their own. They're more than mothers. They are a community who needs us, and we, in turn, need you, and we thank you for these funds, and we are hoping to need each other again. <laughs> Uh, do my colleagues have any questions or comments? I just want to say mothers are dope. 
not just because I'm biased and I'm one, but it's amazing the services that you provide your mothers, the way that you uplift them, the way that you pour into them, the opportunities that you give them, and that this was a really a grassroots organization for Moms by Moms. And so we just want to thank you. We're excited to continue to build this partnership, excited to continue to um, feed into your work and the support that you give not only these mothers, but really our entire community. Because when you make an investment in women, you're making an investment in families. When you make an investment in people who birth children, you are making an investment in community. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for all the ways that you mother. Uh, so uh, if there are no other questions, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Horton. Passed. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Okay, so can we go back to first read again? Ordinance 2187, 2022 on page five and six. This is Ordinance 2187, 2022 to authorize the city clerk to enter into a contract with the Ohio State University for the creation of immigrant, refugee, and migrant town halls and to authorize an appropriation and expenditure within the neighborhood initiative sub fund. So last week we um, contracted with the first uh, uh, black owned company who will be helping us with all of the marketing. This is with a group from Ohio State that will be helping us with the actual facilitation of our immigrant migrant refugee town halls that will be starting later this year, probably around the fall. So we're excited to, after we come back from break, to share more information about what the town halls will look like and who all of our partners are. So um, first I move for, I move to waive second reading. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston? Abstain. I'm sorry, Mr. Bankston, did you sorry. say abstain? Abstain. Okay, Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Faber? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. And um, now I'm in for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston? Abstain. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes, passed. Great. Sorry, I missed one. So, yeah. ordinance 2209. Uh, 2022 to authorize the city clerk to enter into a grant agreement with the Columbus African Festival in support of their 2022 festival to authorize an appropriation expenditure within the neighborhood initiative sub fund and to declare an emergency. On August 20th, 2022, the um, African uh, Dysphoria across Columbus, Central Ohio will come together to celebrate the annual Columbus African Festival with the theme, Together We Prevail. The city of Columbus is home to tens of, tens of thousands of African immigrants from all over the continent. By providing funding support and uplifting our immigrant communities, we build a sense of belonging in Columbus. The annual Columbus African Festival is one way we continue to come together to create these spaces for our immigrant, refugee, and migrant communities. I want to thank Councilmember Remy and Councilmember Bankston for your support of this initiative. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Perfect. That's all I have this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next committee to come before Council is the Finance Committee, chaired by Councilmember our President Pro Tem. President Pro Tem, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Council President. This past Friday, Council Members Barroso de Padilla, Favor, and I stood with our colleagues, the mayor, and reproductive health advocates to announce that Columbus will be taking immediate action to safeguard access to abortion. After the Supreme Court handed down the Dobbs v. Jackson decision and overturned 49 years of precedent established by Roe v. Wade, uh, the Attorney General of the State of Ohio immediately filed to remove the injunction on the uh, six-week abortion ban, near-total abortion ban. Um, he moved very quickly and changed law in a matter of hours, changed the landscape in a matter of hours here in Ohio. So while abortion is still legal in the State of Ohio, up to the point of detection of cardiac activity in the fetus, roughly six weeks pregnant, we know that a majority of people who need an abortion will no longer be able to do so legally within the state. 
The law provides no exception for rape or incest and woefully inadequate protections for the life and health of the pregnant person. The law has stripped Ohioans of their full range of essential, often life-saving, always life-determining healthcare options. It has stripped Ohioans of their bodily autonomy and control over their reproductive lives, of their family autonomy to make decisions about how, whether, or when to be a parent. This ban will also have negative impacts on our city's ability to attract and retain talent, including qualified medical professionals, because it threatens doctors with loss of license, civil liability, and prison time, and fines for performing duties in their capacity as medical professionals. Here in the city of Columbus, we cannot overturn Ohio law. However, I want to be very clear that while Ohio Republicans have implemented this near total ban on abortion, they simply cannot stop the fact that Columbus residents will still need abortion care. Therefore, the next three ordinances I will read represent the first steps in our long-term agenda for reproductive justice in Columbus. Because no one is free and no one is equal without control over their own bodies, lives, and futures. And when people do have access to the full range of reproductive health care services, whether that's birth control, abortion, maternity care, or more, they are healthier and their families thrive. I want to uh, again thank those who stood with us um, last week as Council Members Barossa de Padilla, Favor, and I made these announcements. Um, before I read um, the, the three ordinances, I want to thank colleagues for their support. I want to thank Mayor Ginther, Auditor Kilgore, and City Attorney Klein, um, who were instrumental in getting us uh, to this place as well. Also, before I read um, the, the ordinances, I would like to pause um, for any additional comments from um, colleagues or, or from the, the Women's Caucus, uh, such, as it, such as it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. First up, we have Resolution 143X-2022 to deprioritize the enforcement of laws that criminalize access to safe reproductive health care procedures and services and to declare an emergency. Many important public safety priorities exist in the city of Columbus, from violent crime to mental health care uh, crises and, and all things in between. From a resources perspective, prioritizing the use of public dollars on investigating pregnancy outcomes and health care decisions is simply not a reflection of what Columbus residents most need. So with this legislation, we will move to deprioritize the enforcement of laws that criminalize abortion by directing all city parties, including prosecutors and law enforcement, not to store or share information or conduct surveillance relating to residents' pregnancy outcomes or reproductive health care procedures. Uh, seeing no comments or questions from colleagues, I move for adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. Next is Ordinance 2215-2022 to authorize the city clerk to enter into a nonprofit service agreement with Pro-Choice Ohio in support of a study to determine if residents of the city of Columbus have access to medically accurate and legal uh, and, and legal reproductive health information to authorize an appropriation and expenditure within the Neighborhood Initiative Subfund and to declare an emergency. The information, especially information purporting to be health information that is shared with consumers in our city seeking counsel for their medical choices is a serious public matter. Inside so-called pregnancy or crisis pregnancy centers, volunteers who are not licensed clinicians often wear white coats as they see people in exam rooms. They often target low-income women, they target women of color, and it is a concern to all of us if lies are told in these exam rooms, up to and including claims of an association between abortion and adverse health consequences, or even encouragement not to seek immediate prenatal care. For this very reason, we are introducing an ordinance to contract with Pro-Choice Ohio on a study to ensure residents of the city of Columbus have access to accurate health information. We must prevent crisis pregnancy centers from hoodwinking consumers with false and misleading information. 
So Pro-Choice Ohio, a nonprofit with specialized knowledge, will be conducting a study to examine the activities of these fake health clinics. Emergency action is requested in order to have Pro-Choice Ohio begin their critically needed services. Any questions or comments from colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Thanks, Dan. Barosa de Padilla, Brown Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. And um, as I read this next ordinance, I would like to call uh, Rhiannon Carnes to the podium, uh, co-founder and co-executive director of the Ohio Women's Alliance. Um, next is Ordinance 2216-2022 to authorize the director of the Department of Finance and Management to enter into grant agreements with Planned Parenthood of Greater Ohio and Ohio Women's Alliance in support of ensuring access to reproductive health care to authorize appropriations and a transfer within the general fund, to authorize an expenditure of $1 million within the general fund, and to declare an emergency. With this ordinance, we are ceding a $1 million education and access fund to relieve financial barriers to abortion access, such as transportation, childcare, and lost wages. The funding will also bolster community education regarding safe and legal reproductive health care choices and ensure continuity of information hotlines, peer support, and case management. These funds will be used to provide practical support and medically accurate and legal reproductive health information to residents of our city. To be clear, access to reproductive health care does not include the use of public funds to subsidize abortion procedures themselves, as well as associated services such as anesthesia, laboratory tests, or hospital services, per Ohio Revised Code. I would like to thank Planned Parenthood of Greater Ohio, and I would like to thank the Ohio Women's Alliance for their leadership and their vision in providing resources to our residents. We are requesting emergency action to avoid any delay in providing these services to residents who need them. Uh, Ms. Carnes, Mrs. Carnes, as co-executive director of the Ohio Women's Alliance, as co-founder, thank you for being here, and would you like to share a few words? Yes, thank you. Good evening. Um, good evening, uh, council president, council members. My name is Rhiannon Carnes. I'm the co-founder and co-executive director of Ohio Women's Alliance. And on behalf of Ohio Women's Alliance and the Abortion Fund of Ohio, I want to express our sincere gratitude to the Women's Caucus for including our member assistance program in this important legislation. This new partnership with the Columbus City Council will significantly impact our work to ensure that every Ohioan has access to full reproductive justice and health care, overcoming barriers. The Member Assistance Program will provide culturally competent practical support services, particularly to those seeking abortion care, by offering a 24-7 access to a warm line identifying essential needs, including transportation, lodging, child care. We will also provide nonpartisan political education training on reproductive justice and advocacy to educate folks on what is at stake in our um, state and how to further engage to protect reproductive rights, as well as peer-to-peer -peer opportunities. With the overturn of Roe v. Wade, pregnant people will be heavily scrutinized and people of color are at higher risk of meeting the possibility of criminalization. Black women are three to four more times likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white, Asian, and Latinx women and they face increased detrimental outcomes when entering the maternal health care system. And as a black woman who is currently pregnant, I take these statistics personally. And this is the reality that our community faces when determining when to start a family and weighing the best options to raise a family in a healthy, sustainable environment, as well as surviving through labor and delivery. At Ohio Women's Alliance, we are ensuring people who enter our member assistance program have access to providers that will treat them with non-biased and anti-racist care. Much like an employee assistance program that supports employees with patient navigation and service guidance, our member assistance program will provide similar services and support our most vulnerable community members by applying additional layers of protection that black women and people of color face every single day. Ultimately, we are striving for is for all people to have economic, social, political power, and resources required to make decisions 
about our bodies, our sexuality, and our reproductive health care in all aspects of our lives. The member assistance program will ensure that all people who need abortion will have the wraparound care and support that they need. And we are very grateful to Columbus City Council for joining us in these crucial efforts and we can, as we continue to fight for restoring reproductive justice in Columbus, across our state, and throughout the country. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Before I move for passage, um, I want to again thank Council Member Favor, Council Member Barroso de Padilla, um, for joining in the hard work to get us here today, for doubling down on your commitments to a long-term reproductive justice agenda, and for being voices that truly matter in this fight. So thank you to you both personally very much. Um, and thank you for, for uh, sticking out um, this late meeting, Mrs. Carnes. Um, and with that, I would like to move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Um, moving on in finance um, to our capital budget. So over the past month, we conducted four public hearings in four corners of the city to share the 2022 capital improvements budget proposed by the mayor and seek input from the community on each neighborhood's priorities. Throughout this process, we have received submissions from 27 area commissions and civic associations, 41 speakers, 78 survey submissions from residents. Uh, thank you to all the residents for taking time to share your testimony with us. Also, thank you to the city staff who presented on behalf of their departments and fielded resident questions and concerns, including staying after many of the formal hearings to talk one-on-one -on -one with residents. It's this type of open dialogue that helps to fine tune our goals for our city's future prosperity. Departments are continuing to work on resident concerns that have surfaced from our outreach, and we encourage residents to follow up uh, with us as needed. Through meaningful collaboration between residents, city departments, the mayor's office, and council, we have made amendments to the 2022 capital improvement uh, budget. And um, I just want to call out uh, that uh, all the council members made significant contributions to um, this final version passage here, the passage of this final version here tonight. So I want to thank each of you for that. Um, I want to just uplift quickly a couple of those. Um, Elevate Northland, I know, is a really exciting neighborhood-based project. Um, uh, the Refuge, that's obviously in Northland, the Refuge on the west side, um, Vista Village, um, the ADU uh, pilot, accessory dwelling units pilot that Councilmember Favor um, worked so hard on. And there's really um, too many to name, but um, I would like to thank everyone involved of course, everyone on council, the mayor, the auditor, Matt Erickson with LRO, community engagement and CTV. I want to call out Representative Latina Humphrey, um, who attended all of the budget hearings in her district um, and was a voice for her constituents and her area commissions in this process. I thought it was a great addition to a community feedback process. Uh, the budget presented represents a plan uh, for the expenditures of monies in 2022 for a variety of capital improvement projects and establishes the 2022 capital improvement budget in the amount of $1.24 billion. Additionally, um, the, the um, capital improvements program is the primary guide for the 2022 capital improvements budget um, and actually incorporates uh, calendar years 2022 through 2027. Each of those will be two um, different ordinances which we have um, tabled for the purposes of the hearing process and which I will remove from the table and move for passage um, individually. So first, uh, 0134X-2022 to accept the Capital Improvements Program 2022 through 2027 as described herein as the primary guide for future capital improvements budget ordinances and to declare an emergency. First, I move to remove this from the table. Bankston, Burroughs, Adi Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. Next, I move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Clerk, please call the roll. 
Bankston, Barossa, De Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Arden. Amended. And I move for adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa, De Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Arden. Adopt it. Thank you. And then um, next is the ordinance of um, for the capital budget itself, ordinance 1896-2022 to adopt a capital improvements budget for the 12 months ending December 31st, 2022, or until such a time as a new capital improvements budget is adopted, establishing a project budget for capital improvements requiring legislative authorization in 2022, uh, and to repeal ordinance number 2707-2021 as amended and to declare an emergency. Um, I move to remove this from the table. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. I move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Okay. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Amend it. And I move for passage. Okay. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next is Ordinance 1976-2022 to amend the 2021 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize the appropriation and transfer of funds from the Special Income Tax Fund to the Construction Management Taxable Bond Fund to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to enter into a contract on behalf of the Office of Construction Management with 2K General Company towards North Market Interior and Exterior Renovation Project to authorize the expenditure of up to $2,627,000 from the Construction Management Taxable Bond Fund and to declare an emergency. This building is owned by the city. North Market is a tenant. The interior scope of work will include removal of paint of the first and second floor ceilings and repainting. It will upgrade the existing lighting, uh, replace the existing residential ceiling fans to commercial air circulation fans. The exterior scope will include tuck pointing the existing brick on all faces of the building, resealing around the existing windows. All, full, all four alternates in the bid are being accepted. The alternates include upgrading all four restrooms and replacing existing air curtains at each building entrance. The Department of Finance and Management solicited bids that were formally advertised on May 23rd. The city received only one response from 2K General Company, and the Office of Construction Management recommends the bid in the amount of $2,627,000 to be made to the sole responsive bidder, 2K General Company. Emergency action is requested to complete the exterior portion of the scope of work so as not to hinder the start of construction of the new tower. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next is Ordinance 2130-2022 to authorize the Finance and Management Director to establish various purchase orders for fuel on behalf of the Fleet Management Division per the terms and conditions of previously established universal term contracts to authorize and transfer within the Fleet Operating Fund to authorize the expenditure of $1,500,000 from the Fleet Management Operating Fund and to declare an emergency. This legislation authorizes an expenditure of $1,500,000 from the Fleet Management Operating Fund from the previously established universal term contracts for bulk unleaded diesel, biodiesel fuels, and fueling services. The fuel vendor, Benchmark Biodiesel Incorporated, continues to be in good standing and is not debarred according to federal excluded parties listing. Emergency action is requested so that bulk fuel for the city's vehicle fleet can continue uninterrupted. Questions or, or comments? I move for passage. Quick, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Uh, for the last ordinance in finance, I would like to direct you to page six in first reading. Uh, we have ordinance 1988-2022 to authorize the Director of Man Finance and Management to enter into contract with ChargePoint Incorporated to provide charging station software maintenance for the Front Street Garage electric vehicle charging stations for the Department of Building and Zoning Services in accordance with the sole source procurement provisions of Columbus City Code and to authorize the expenditure of $58,017 $58, from the Fleet Operating Fund. Uh, due to the proprietary nature of the charging station software and compatibility of existing charging equipment, ChargePoint Incorporated directly services and supports their charging stations. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move to waive second reading. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Waived. I move for passage. 
Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Adipa, Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. May I move to Recreation and Parks? Please. In Recreation and Parks, we have Ordinance 1610-2022 to authorize the Director of Recreation and Parks to enter into contract with 2K General Company for construction of the Glenwood and Windsor Pool Replacements Project to authorize the appropriation of $3 million within the CDBG Fund in accordance with the City's U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development 2022 Annual Action Plan as approved by Council to authorize the transfer of $3,685,515 within the Recreation and Parks Voted Bond Fund to authorize the amendment of the 2021 capital improvements budget, to authorize the expenditure of $18,128,000 from the CDBG fund and recreation and parks voted bond fund and to declare an emergency. The Windsor pool was originally built in 1968 and Glenwood in 1973. After serving the city of Columbus for more than 50 years, both facilities need to be replaced to function in an efficient and safe manner. The bathhouse at Windsor was built in 2012 and it will undergo minor improvements and both pools will be improved to be more inclusive to persons with various abilities, meeting the requirements obtained by the public outreach activities, which are part of Rec and Parks Aquatics Capital Improvement Plan. Both pools are limited for programming currently based on their amenities and it is the intent of the design to increase capacity for programs and to increase attendance at these pools overall. The department is working hard not to impact the 23 swimming seasons at both these locations. These construction contracts will remove and replace both pools. With the time required for demolition, construction permits, long lead time on materials, um, it is necessary that construction be started as soon as possible. It should be noted that there was no quorum during the July Rec and Parks Commission meeting. However, per the present commissioners, since there is uh, August recess for commission and council, this ordinance was requested to be sent through the legislation approval process in order to avoid a delay um, with this project. Emergency action is requested so that the contractor can complete all necessary work to minimize the impact on 2023 swim season. Any questions or comments from colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Uh, next is Ordinance 2039-2022 to authorize the Director of Recreation and Parks to enter into contract with Smoot Company for construction management and inspection services for the Glenwood and Windsor Pool Replacements Project to authorize the transfer of $1,547,670.91 thousand six hundred and seventy dollars and ninety one cents within the rec and parks voted bond fund to authorize the amendment of the 2021 capital improvements budget to authorize the expenditure of one million five hundred forty seven thousand six hundred seventy dollars and ninety one cents from the rec and parks voted bond fund and to declare an emergency this legislation authorizes the department to go in contract with Smoot company for construction management and ex inspection services for those pool projects. A selection team evaluated the proposals and recommended Smoot uh, to perform the work. They were chosen based on their referenced projects, experience, qualifications. Um, of note, professional services contracts are quality-based selections and not based on uh, price. Therefore, costs were not requested, nor were they part of this evaluation. Emergency action is requested so that the contractor can complete all necessary work in order to minimize the impact on the 2023 swim season. Any questions? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Uh, next, uh, we have Ordinance 2108-2022 to authorize the Director of Recreation and Parks to enter into contract with General Temperature Control to replace the chiller and related components at Dodge Community Center to waive the competitive bidding provisions of Columbus City Code Chapter 329 to authorize the transfer of $252,780 within Rec and Parks Voted Bond Fund to authorize the amendment of the 2021 Capital Improvements Budget to authorize the expenditure of $252,780 from the Recreation and Parks fund and voted bond fund and to declare an emergency. Dodge serves as a cooling center in extreme heat for our west side residents and is frequently utilized for an emergency shelter by the Red Cross for victims of fire, flooding, and other urgent needs. In addition to the daily programming and operations that take place at Dodge, these additional emergency uses make this center a vital part of our overall emergency response in the city. Unfortunately, the chiller that provides air conditioning for Dodge is failing. Uh, CRPD HVAC staff have had several calls for service on this unit in recent history and it is at the end of its useful life. The unit is currently operating at about 50% of its capacity and is in danger of failing to operate completely 
in the near future. Department HVAC staff have reached out to vendors to check on availability and lead times for a new chiller, and we're told that 40 to 60 weeks is common right now to receive a newly ordered chiller of this size. General temperature control is able to secure the right-sized 130-ton chiller that was already in production for delivery at the end of this month from Carrier with a lead time of only three to four weeks, and it should be available for delivery um, later, later this month, early next month. Uh, the Rec and Parks Department has had a positive working relationship with general temperature control and has had success with Carrier-made products. Um, due to the emergency use that takes, uh, that takes place at this facility on a regular basis, it is imperative that the work to replace this chill chiller be done as soon as possible. As a result, Rec and Parks is requesting to waive bidding and enter into contracts so the chiller can be replaced immediately. Any questions? I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. And my last ordinance in Rec and Parks is Ordinance 2109-2022 to authorize the Director of Recreation and Parks to enter into various contracts for management of the Urban Forestry Master Plan, to authorize and direct City Auditor to establish auditor certificates in the amount of $1,500,000 for various expenditures in conjunction with the management of the Urban Forestry Master Plan, to authorize the appropriation of $500,000 within the CDBG Fund in accordance with the City's U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development 2022 Annual Action Plan as approved by Council, to authorize the Director of Recreation and Parks to modify an existing contract with Davie Resource Group to continue citywide street treat inventory, to authorize the expenditure of $2 million from the CDBG Fund and Rec and Parks Voted Bond Fund, and to declare an emergency. In April of 2021, the Columbus Rec and Parks Commission voted in support of and Columbus City Council passed a resolution to support the Urban Forestry Master Plan and its immediate implementation. By authorizing the implementation of the UFMP, the forestry section of Rec and Parks can implement key recommendations through hiring staff, purchasing equipment, procuring tree service contracts, inventorying the city's street trees, designing a new facility for forestry's north zone, and engage, engaging urban forestry consultants. Emergency action is requested to allow immediate implementation, continuing this urgent work of prioritizing our tree canopy. With challenges on the horizon like population growth, public health issues, and climate change, continuing strategic investment in Columbus's trees immediately will ensure uh, uh, the continued health and safety of our residents. Questions or comments? I move for passage. Second. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. Um, oh, uh, I, next, may I move to the Education Committee? And uh, uh, Councilmember Barossa de Padilla. Uh, in education today, we have one ordinance, 0604-2022, to authorize the Director of Education to enter into contracts with various nonprofit organizations to provide after-school programs and services to authorize the expenditure of $331,000 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. This ordinance allows for the Office of Education to support nearly 2,200 children in the after-school grant program. By contracting with almost 20 community program providers, the city will continue to ensure that our young people have access to a safe environment during those critical after-school hours. Do folks have questions or comments? Great, so I move to amend to 30 day by voice. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston. Yes. Ms. Barossa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Abstain. Mr. Dorrance. Yes. Ms. Favor. Abstain. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes, amend it. I now move for, uh, to waive second reading. Yes. Your second. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston. Yes. Ms. Barossa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Abstain. Mr. Dorrance. Yes. Ms. Favor. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes, waived. I now move for passage as amended. <laughs> Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston. Yes. Ms. Barossa de Padilla. Ms. Mm -hmm. Brown. Mr. Dorrance. Yes. Ms. Favor. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes, passed. Thank you, Council Member. Um, next in education, I would like to direct us back to page 
six, um, Yes, to page six, first readings, ordinance 2186-2022, to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to enter into contract with the W.E. Upjohn Unemployment Trustee Corporation for evaluation of the Columbus Promise Program and to authorize an expenditure from an existing auditor's certificate. We will be contracting with the Upjohn Institute to provide us with analysis and feedback on the impact on um, post-secondary enrollment and the effectiveness of the implementation of the Columbus Promise Program. Um, thank you to Council President Hardin for his leadership in this program geared towards Columbus City School graduates. We look forward to hearing the outcome of um, the assessment. Any questions or comments? I move first move to waive second reading. Quick, please call the roll. <clears throat> Bankston, Burroughs, Adi, Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Horton. Wait. I move for passage. Okay. Kirk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Adi, Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Horton. Adopted. And that's all I have in my committees. Thank you, President Horton. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next committee to come before council is the Public Utilities Committee, chaired by Councilmember Dorn. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. In the Public Utilities Committee, we have Ordinance 2136-2022 uh, to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to modify the contract with Decker Construction Company for utility cut and restoration services for the Department of Public Utilities to authorize the expenditure of $1,200,000 from the Water Operating Fund at, and to declare an emergency. Uh, various types of utility excavations are performed within the City of Columbus right away and city-owned properties uh, by the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, work typically involves repair of existing pavement, curbs, sidewalks, and wheelchair ramps. Uh, the department routinely outsources this restoration work to, to a contractor that is equipped and trained to make these repairs. Uh, this ordinance is submitted as emergency because recent changes to restoration requirements have caused costs associated with the contract to increase significantly and to avoid lack of service availability to the, uh, because of the expiration of the current contract. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Yes. Thank you. That's all I have in my committees this evening. Mr. Chair, next committee coming before council is the Housing Committee, chaired by Councilmember Favor. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Hardin. <clears throat> Tonight in the Housing Committee, uh, if you do not mind, if I could uh, take Ordinance 1843-2022 out of order. Please. Thank you. Uh, in the Rules and Reference Committee, we have, uh, which is in partnership with the Housing Committee, we have Ordinance 1843-2022 to amend Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Codes to alter the affordable housing requirements applicable in market ready, ready for revitalization, and ready for opportunity community reinvestment areas, and to incorporate certain administrative modifications. As many of you know, we have been working very hard to finalize the updated community reinvestment area or CRA, which I will say a hundred times tonight, uh, residential tax abatement policy. The following ordinance are part of the CRA's triannual reassessment update. Last December, we hosted a series of public hearings to hear community feedback, and I knew that we needed to push for deeper affordability. After more revisions last month, we again hosted a series of public hearings. On July 11th, I still believe that there was some more work to do, and over the last two weeks, our office actively worked with other member offices, with the Department of Development, and had further meetings with residents. First, I'd like to take this time to say thank you to each and every resident that has submitted feedback. We read every email, and we thank you for your engagement and passion in this space. I understand that the topic of using the community reinvestment area policy as a tool to incentivize affordable housing development is not always popular and can bring out polarizing opinions. No policy is perfect. There's a quote by Winston Churchill that I had to remind myself of last week, which is that perfection is the enemy of progress. And ultimately what I am striving for as the chair of housing is progress, which is the reality that I, along with this legislative body, cannot change decades of inaction, housing discrimination, or disinvestment overnight. Effective work is about moving towards the desired destination, which for me is ensuring that we have safe, habitable, affordable, and equitable housing for all residents in Columbus. And I can confidently share a few of the updates in the proposed CRA policy where we have made amazing strides and will have tremendous impact through this policy alone including 
the removal of abatement for market rate, new construction, and rehab single family homes. Homes, excuse me. Under the 2018 policy, a single family home, new construction, or renovation received a 15 year, 100% tax abatement, regardless of income level of the homeowner. The new policy requires the homeowner to have an Aryan median income of 120% or less in order to receive the abatement. Deeper and wider affordability. In 2018, a developer was required to provide 10% of their units at 80% of the Aryan median income and 10% at 100% of the Aryan median income. The new policy allows for two different options. One providing units at 60% and 80% of the area median income, and the other requiring 30% of their units at 80% of the area median income. Unit distribution. In 2018, there were no requirements around spreading the affordability across unit types, leading many developments to have affordability in the studio and one bedroom units. In the new policy, affordable units must be evenly spread across all unit types allowing families the ability to rent one of these affordable units. Significant increases in the fee and lieu option. In the new policy, we made significant increase in the cost for developers to choose the fee and lieu option, incentivizing the inclusion of affordability in the project. So for example, in the ready for revitalization, the fee went up to over 300%. What is new with the fee and lieu uh, option this time around is now called a fee in lieu escalation. And I wanna thank my colleagues uh, for weighing in heavily as we uh, worked over the past few weeks to reconcile uh, with many of our um, uh, personal opposition to the fee in lieu. So in the new policy, a yearly escalation clause was added to the fee in lieu policy, further incentivizing the developer to choose to build the affordability in their project. Also including in the new policy is ready for opportunity affordability. In 2018, two of the three categories required affordability, while the third category did not. In the new policy, ready for opportunity will now require 10% of the units at 80% of the area median income and 10% at 100% of the area median income. This will help capture affordability in these neighborhoods if major development happens in the next three years and then also a six month reevaluation. The Director of Development and my office are declaring a six month reevaluation of the fee and lieu numbers. And once again, I wanna thank all of our residents that took time out of their day to send uh, my office along with my colleagues uh, emails regarding their uh, support uh, and opposition to the policy overall. With all of this being said, I would like to reiterate that there is no silver bullet to fix the problem of housing, and we cannot fix this housing crisis with one policy. As the housing chair, I am committed to prioritizing affordable housing, passing progressive housing policies that protect our most vulnerable residents, and continuing partnerships with our amazing housing advocates as we implement the following opportunities. Legal aid, tenant, tenant protection expansion, which includes $1.5 million for major expansion of the Tenant Advocacy Project, which aims to provide enhanced legal representation for residents facing an eviction. Keeping folks housed is the first priority, but keeping an eviction off of a person's record is just as important. An eviction judgment can create severe barriers in finding future safe and sanitary housing options. Housing for All 1.0 and 2.0. Housing for All 1.0 aim to provide protections against discrimination for folks that have different sources of income, allow options for how residents pay their security deposit, and requires landlords provi to provide receipts when one is not automatically generated. In Housing for All 2.0, we will continue to focus on tenant protections and provide resource guides for folks who need assistance along the way the accessory dwelling unit and land bank affordability programs. As just mentioned by uh, President Pro Tem, Liz Brown, uh, we are now uh, can confidently say that we're receiving $1.5 million for these two pilot programs that will include affordability components in each. More details will come. 
and then the creation of a fair housing department. I want to thank um, amazing um, housing advocates that have been advocating uh, on behalf of this specific uh, piece of um, changes that will come to the city. And uh, we are excited to dig in deep into the creation of this. And then last but certainly not least is advocating for ARPA dollars to be allocated toward affordable housing in the city of Columbus. I invite you all to continue to stay engaged with our office and with the Department of Development to share your ideas and stay updated on what the city is doing around housing. And with that, I will ask if there are any questions or comments by my colleagues. If not, I would move for passage on ordinance 1843-22. And my apologies, I move to remove this ordinance from the table and amend as submitted to the clerk. Clerk, please call the roll. Did I do that wrong? Individually. Oh. I, I move to remove this ordinance from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hart. Moved. And now I move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hart. Amend it. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1868-2022 to amend the AC Humco reinvestment area. Madam to Chair, I don't think we passed it. Yeah. We got oh. one more vote. Oh, I'm way too excited. <laughs> I don't have my apologies. <laughs> and it's by voice. This one's by With me? Mm-hmm. I move for passage by voice. As amended. As amended. That's not on here. Is there a second? Second. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston. Yes. Ms. Barosa D. Padilla. No. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Favor. Yes. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes. May I move on now? Okay. I'm sorry. Way too excited. Uh, next, we have Ordinance 1868-2022 to amend the AC Humco Community Reinvestment Area to align with recent changes contained in Chapter 4565 of Columbus City Codes <coughs> and to amend the geographic boundaries of AC Humco Community Reinvestment Area. I uh, believe Mr. Joe Motil, are you still present? Thank you for hanging in there, sir. Floor is yours. Joe Motil, 167 West Cook, Columbus, Ohio. President Harden, Pro Tem Brown, members of City Council. And I uh, do want to thank Councilwoman Favor for all the public hearings and listening to all of the concerns from all the residents. Uh, as she indicated, this is a very contentious issue and uh, in terms of the tax abatements and such, but I uh, uh, appreciate her uh, support and listening to us. Now to go with the AC Humco, there's absolutely no reason whatsoever to consider expanding these boundaries in one of the most affluent, desirable, and risk-free development areas of Columbus. These residents have an average income levels in the six figures and average home values in this area of Victorian Village and Harrison West are above $400,000 and many homes are twice that amount. And when are you ever going to recognize the adverse effect that these tax abatements are having on the social, economic, and well-being of individuals and families, especially underserved communities and those on fixed and low to moderate income levels and families? The council and the mayor continue to defund public education while sacrificing property tax revenues that make up only 6% of the city budget for city income tax revenues that make up about 80% of the budget. And in the case of this expansion, why? Just so you can possibly hang your hat on maybe creating 44 apartment units for those of incomes of $52,500 a year or giving a developer an opportunity to buy out those units. Does this really have an impact on our affordable housing crisis, or is it continuing to add to the defunding of public education while giving a favored city hall developer a handout? According to state law, quote, in order to create a community reinvestment area, a municipal corporation must conduct a survey of the housing within its jurisdiction and after, this, after the survey, adopt a resolution describing the boundaries of the area which contains the conditions required to meet the definition of a CRA, end of quote. The survey of this expansion was a joke and does not justify this expansion. In none of the city of Columbus's six distressed criteria is applicable to the AC Humco CRA, whether it is an increase in poverty, 
vacancy rate of housing, rents, median household income, population decrease, decrease, or mortgage foreclosures. You cannot, once again, as with the Quarry, Grandview Crossing, Kenny and Henderson CRAs, and others, base your criteria for a CRA on a handful of photos of a few code enforcement issues, thus claiming they justify the need for a CRA. Just like the other CRAs, this expansion is all about a particular development, or in this case, possibly two new developments, Castos, Buttles and Neal Avenue, and the Michigan Avenue development. And it would further appear that this expansion is not only an unnecessary gift to another darling city hall developer, but may well be in violation of state law. Almost a year to the day, the city council had enough sense to table indefinitely the expansion of this CRA into Victorian Village, which again is one of the most affluent neighborhoods in Columbus. A vote to expand the CRA absolute, makes absolutely no sense at all. This is yet another counterproductive abusive example of tax abating our way out of our affordable housing crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Motu. Uh, Director Stevens, if you would like to make um, some comments in, in regards to Mr. Motil's remarks. Thank you, uh, President Hardin, Chair Favor, members of council. When we looked at the AC Humco expansion, we looked at the medium household income in this neighborhood is well over $110,000. We know that there's gonna be redevelopment occurring in this area, and we understand that if we wanna have mixed income neighborhoods, we need to be able to have income qualified reserved affordable units as part of that new development that's occurring there. So having individuals making 50, 60, $70,000 a year be part of that community we felt was very important. We also, as we updated the policy, as, as Chair Favor, as you, as you uh, reviewed it, we made sure that the single family home improvements were only eligible, the abatement was only eligible for those individuals who are income qualified up to 120% AMI. So we feel this is an important uh, step to getting affordable units in neighborhoods that have been exclusive to our uh, members of our community prior to this. Thank you, Director Stevens. And I, I had the opportunity along with uh, the Director of Housing Strategies, Aaron Prosser, to have um, some conversation with members of the community uh, just late last week, or excuse me, early last week. Um, and there was a lot of pushback around there already being naturally affordable um, uh, apartments in that a specific geography. Can you speak to how you reconcile the differences there? Uh, thank you, Chair Favor. The, big, the biggest difference that we're reconciling this is while there might be some naturally occurring affordability at some of those apartments there now, they are not required to lease to income qualified individuals making 60 and 80% AMI. Putting this uh, in place will require uh, those units to not only be affordable, but uh, available to individuals in that income bracket. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments for Director Stevens or for Mr. Motil regarding AC Humco? Okay, thank you, Mr. Motil, for your comments. Um, and advocacy. With that, I would um, move to remove from the table. By voice. Uh, by uh, Madam Chair, are we yes. going to call the? We're going to. We have another speaker for 1843 that we missed, but I know when we want to bring him up during the uh, uh, NCRA conversation. So I'll follow your direction on when you want to do that. Yes, I'll finish this After one and the, then I can go back. Got it. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? No. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? No. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Hardin? Yes. Now I move to amend as submitted to the clerk by voice. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? No. I'm sorry. No. There was a no. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? No. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. I move for passage by voice. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barossa de Padilla? No. Mr. Or Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? No. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Ordinance is passed. 
Thank you. And my apologies, uh, we did have a speaker uh, for Ordinance 1843, which, which was the first ordinance that laid the foundation for the, um, the ones that are coming after this, Ms. Uh, Malcolm Porter. Hi, good evening. Good evening, thanks, thanks for accommodating me. I think this is relevant, hopefully. Uh, my name is Malcolm Porter, Building Industry Association, 445 Hutchison Avenue uh, in Columbus, and to Council Chair Favor, and to Council President Hardin, and all members of Council. We appreciate the work that Council is doing, along with the administration, both in tonight's policy, but in the broader areas of the challenges of housing. While we do not necessarily agree with all the elements of the proposal that you've passed, we do appreciate the opportunity to have been engaged in the process. There were two goals to this policy from our perspective and understanding of your intentions, improving housing affordability for some of our residents and increasing the income diversity in our neighborhoods. The costs associated with the new policy will be paid for by two parties, the developers of these new projects and the renters of those who live in the market rate apartments that are created in these projects. We know there were strong feelings amongst council members regarding the fee in lieu of option, which led to the addition of the annual cost escalator of the CPI plus 5%. It's our perspective that developers have a preference to comply with the tenant mix goals. The initial years of the current policy, over 90% of units were fulfilling those goals and very few developments used a fee in lieu of. This has changed with recent projects the uncertainty of this new policy looming and the extraordinary economic environment that developers are working in today caused developers to lock in on cost certainty in order to be able to move towards construction. The costs associated with this policy now get factored into a project's financial calculus along with materials, supply chain challenges, labor availability, and dramatically rising interest rates for financing capital. Time will tell us if the policy hits the mark and contributes to a healthier housing market. We think it does. We hope it does. You and we will be watching very closely, as you've indicated, uh, for this six-month period. From our perspective, we hope to make sure we work to avoid the worst-case scenario, which is that even less housing gets built in our community if the economics turn upside down. So we look forward to watching closely with you. BI members would ask that I use my final minute to remind us all that the majority of housing in our community is built in the market rate portion of our, mar of our marketplace. Part of our housing problem is that increased costs mean that more people cannot afford market rents and thus are staying in direct and indirect housing subsidy pools. Thus, we need to be able to figure out simply how to build more housing at all levels. The community is best served when the market rate segment can serve the largest possible percentage of our population. This ultimately would free up public support for additional purposes. Reforms to the zoning code, to our development approval processes are key future items for all market segments, subsidized or market rate. We continue to be told that the zoning code reform will take several years for the city to implement. We strongly encourage all parties to consider interim fruit options that could benefit and help our affordability challenge. We look forward to working with the city as best we can on our housing market to better meet our community's needs. Thanks for accommodating me. No, thank you for your advocacy, and I apologize for my, my step, misstep. Are there any uh, comments or Colleagues, uh, comments by my colleagues. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments by my colleagues. Thank you. Thank Thank you, you. Sir. All right, next we have Ordinance 1869-2022 to amend the Cleveland Avenue Community Reinvestment Area to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to table, I move to pass. What am I doing? We're moved from the table. What is wrong with me tonight? <laughs> You are. I move to remove from the table, move this ordinance from the table. Second. Thank you. Clerk, please call the row. Bangston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. And now I move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. 
Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Borough, City, Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hart. Amend it. Now I move for passage. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Burroughs, Adipa, Dia, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1870-2022 to amend the Far South Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of Columbus City Codes. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to move, remove from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Burroughs, Adipa, Dia, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. Now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hart. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1871-2022 to amend the Far West Broad Community Reinvestment Area to align with the recent changes contained in 40, Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Codes and to amend the geographic boundaries of the Far West Broad Community Reinvestment Area. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues. I remove to remove, I move to remove from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Moved. Thank you. Now I move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Thank you. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Amended. Now I move for passage. Thank you. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. If Ordinance 1872 2022 to amend the Franklinton Area G Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Codes. There are no questions or comments by my colleagues. I move to remove from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa Sadi Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pat. And now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa Sadi Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1873-2022 to amend the Grandview Crossing Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Codes and to set forth the circumstances under which a combined parcel resulting from the combination of a parcel within the original CRA boundaries and parcels outside of the original CRA boundaries will be deemed to be within the CRA. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to remove from the table. Second. Quick, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Adi Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. And now I move for passage. Second. Quick, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Adi Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1874-2022 to amend the Northland Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Codes and to set forth the circumstances under which a combined parcel resulting from the combination of a parcel within the original CRA boundaries and parcels outside of the original CRA boundaries will be deemed to be within the CRA. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to remove from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Sadi Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. And now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Sadi Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1875-2022 to amend the Quarry Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Codes and to set forth the circumstances under which a combined parcel resulting from the combination of a parcel within the original CRA boundaries and parcels outside of the original CRA boundaries will be deemed to be within the CRA. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to remove from the table. Second. Remove. Our clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Moved. And now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Now I toss, would like to turn it over to Council President Pro Tem Brown. Thank you so much, Council Member Favor. Uh, next is Ordinance 1876-2022 to amend the Wineland Park University Area F community reinvestment area to align with the recent changes contained in chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code and to amend the geographic boundaries of the Wineland Park community reinvestment area. I first move to remove this from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa City Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. And now, do we have to do that by voice? Oh, by. Probably. Just move to reconsider. Okay, I, I move to reconsider. There's, clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barossa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Uh, yes. 
Mr. Dorrance. Yes. Ms. Faber. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes, reconsidered. And I move to remove from the table yep. by voice. Is there a second? Second. Clerk, please call the roll. By voice. Mr. Bankston. Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorrance. Yes. Ms. Faber. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes, removed from the table. I move for passage by voice. Is there a second? Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston. Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorrance. Yes. Ms. Faber. Yes. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes, removed. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Ordinance 1877-2022 to amend the 5th by Northwest Community Reinvestment Area to align with the recent changes contained in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Codes and to amend the geographic boundaries of the 5th by Northwest Community Reinvestment Area. I move uh, to remove this from the table by voice. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston. Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Faber. Mr. Remy, yes. President Harden. Yes. And I move for passage by voice. Second. Clerks, we call the roll. Mr. Bankston. Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Faber. Abstain. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes. Pass. Back to you, Chair Faber. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1878-2022 to amend the Kinney and Henderson Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code and to set forth the circumstances under which a combined parcel resulting from the combination of a parcel within the original CRA boundaries and parcels outside of the original CRA boundaries will be deemed to be within the CRA. There are no questions or comments by my colleagues. I move to remove from the table. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Now I move for passage. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1879-2022 to amend the Brookwood Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to remove from the table. Thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. And now I move for passage. Thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1880-2022 to amend the Milo Grogan Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to remove from the table. Thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. And now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1881-2022 to amend the Hilltop Area D Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code and to set forth the circumstances under which a combined parcel resulting from the combination of a parcel within the original CRA boundaries and parcels outside of the original CRA boundaries will be deemed to be within the CRA. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to remove from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Adipa, Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. And now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Burroughs, Adipa, Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1882-2022 to amend the North Central Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code and to set forth the circumstances under which a combined parcel resulting from the combination of a parcel within the original CRA boundaries and parcels outside of the original CRA boundaries will be deemed to be within the CRA. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to remove from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Moved. And I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1884-2022 to amend the Short North Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code and to set forth the circumstances under which a combined parcel resulting from the combination of a parcel within the original CRA boundaries and parcels outside of the original CRA boundaries will be deemed to be within the CRA. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to remove from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. 
Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Moved. And now I move to a move, move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1885-2022 to amend the Southside Area C Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code to amend the boundaries of the CRA and to set forth the circumstances under which a combined parcel resulting from the combination of a parcel within the original CRA boundaries and parcels outside of the original CRA boundaries will be deemed to be within the CRA. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to remove from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Move. Next, I move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Amend it. And now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. I will now turn the mic over to President Pro Tem Brown. Thank you, Chair Favor. Um, next is Ordinance 1886-2022 to amend the Near East Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code and to set forth the circumstances under which a combined parcel resulting from the combination of a parcel within the original CRA boundaries and parcels outside of the original CRA boundaries will be deemed to be within the CRA. I first move to remove from the table. By voice. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barossa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Removed. And I move for passage by voice. Second. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barossa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes. Abstain. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1887-2022 to amend the Far East Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code to set forth the circumstances under which a combined parcel resulting from the combination of a parcel within the original CRA boundaries and parcels outside of the original CRA boundaries will be deemed to be within the CRA and to further clarify exemption requirements. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues. I move to remove from the table. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. And now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1888-2022 to amend the Linden Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to remove from the table. Clerk, please call the roll. Bingston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. Now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bingston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next, we have Ordinance 1889 2022 to amend the Northeast Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to remove from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. Now, and now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Next, we have Ordinance 1890 2022 to amend the Southeast Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues. I move to remove from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. And now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1891-2022 to amend the 161 Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move to remove from the table. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. And now I move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. And now I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 1892 2022 
to amend the Livingston and James Community Reinvestment Area to make modifications to align with the updates located in Chapter 4565 of the Columbus City Code and to set forth the circumstances under which a combined parcel resulting from the combination of a parcel within the original CRA boundaries and parcels outside of the original CRA boundaries will be deemed to be within the CRA. If there are any questions, no questions from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. I move to remove from the table. Second. Same thing. Yep. Clerk, please call the roll. Bangston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Removed. Thank you. And uh, since this is our the last but certainly not least of the CRAs, I just want to say, um, give my appreciation, extend my appreciation to the administration, uh, to Director Stevens and his team. Um, this is um, many months of a lot of work to be able to get here, lots of hard conversations, and I appreciate the continued dialogue uh, between you and your team um, as we work to move uh, this process along. Um, and to make sure we have safe and affordable housing for all residents in Columbus. And to my colleagues who are probably sick of me talking about housing, um, thank you all for engaging and being part of this process. I know that we all are committed uh, to ensuring uh, that our residents have roofs over our heads. So thank you all. If that, I move for passage. Second. Madam Chair, I'll actually take a moment to give our appreciation uh, to you uh, uh, as a body. Um, this has been a long process uh, and probably one of the most important issues facing our community. Um, the conversations are not easy. Um, there are folks that have very passionate feelings um, that represent all aspects of our community. Um, and uh, no one can doubt throughout all of those conversations your commitment or sincerity to creating more affordability in housing in our community. Uh, and for that, I'm grateful and proud of your, your leadership. Um, I too uh, appreciate the leadership of and the work done by, in, in particular, Director Stevens and his leadership team, um, and uh, and the outreach that he has done to work with our council to help us understand what was coming, um, to un help us understand the policy, but also to um, work with this as we uh, changed and amended the process to make sure that we got to the very best policy um, that could pass. And in general, what I would say is that the CRA policy that we voted on tonight is better than the policy that was before, full stop. And for that, I think that that is good policy making um, by this body and by the administration. Uh, I too look forward to the six month period. It gives us a chance to follow data mm -hmm. uh, and make decisions that are based off of data uh, to, to continue to improve our housing supply and affordable housing supply at that. So with that, uh, clerk, please call the roll. Bangston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hart. Pass. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Ordinance 2095 2022 to amend the 2021 capital improvement budget to authorize the city auditor to transfer funds within the affordable housing bond fund and with the development taxable bond fund to authorize the director of development to enter into agreement with Healthy Linden Homes 2 LLC a nonprofit company, and an amount up to $2 million to develop up to 30 new rental housing units in zip code 43211 to authorize the expenditure of up to $1,191,267 from the Affordable Housing Bond Fund and up to $808,733 from the Development Taxable Bond Fund and to declare an emergency. Healthy Linden Homes 2 LLC a nonprofit company seeks to further address the housing affordability issues that Columbus faces by developing up to 30 units of new construction rental housing in zip code 43211. In addition to high quality affordable places to call home, the tenant families who will reside in these units will have access to a variety of supportive services and advocacy opportunities. Uh, Director Stevens, do you have anything else you'd like to add at this time? Uh, thank you, President Hardin, Chair Favor, members of the council. This is another example of the different tools we use. We just spent a lot of time updating the abatement policy, but this is a tool in our strategy of investing in affordable housing where the market doesn't, and this is the way we're using that, using our bond dollars. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments by my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for a passage by voice. Clark, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston. Ms. Burroughs Adipadia. Yeah. Ms. Brown. Mr. Dorns? Yes. Ms. Faber? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Pass. 
Thank you, President Harm. May I move on to Health and Human Services? Please. Uh, in Health and Human Services, we have Ordinance 2122-2022 to authorize the Executive Director of Celebrate One to accept a grant from the Coalition on Homelessness and Housing in Ohio of up to $1,180,274 for the Healthy Beginnings at Home 2.0 program from the Housing Assistance to Improve Birth and Child Outcomes Grant with the Ohio Department of Health to appropriate $1,180,000 and $1,180,274 $1, within the general government grant fund to authorize subgrantee contracts and expenditures within the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority for $884,845, Homeless Families Foundation for Families Doing Business as Homes for Families for $709,994, Barbara Pope Associates for $86,400, and AJC Solutions for $124,035 to waive the competitive bidding requirements of the Columbus City Code and to declare an emergency. Infant vitality is inextricably linked to housing. Healthy Beginnings at Home 2.0 program is aimed at reducing the infant mortality of high-risk pregnant women by providing affordable housing intervention to those living in unstable housing. This program provides rental assistance, housing stabilization services, as well as prenatal and postnatal support to promote the health of a mother and her family as early as possible in pregnancy and to minimize the impact of unstable housing on pregnant women living in the Celebrate One high-risk target zip codes within Columbus. Celebrate One will administer the grant in collaboration with two community partners, Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority and Homeless Family Foundation, doing business for families to accomplish the goals of the housing program. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, and I know that we are joined by uh, Director Stapleton. Do you have any additional comments you'd like to make at this time? Uh, no, Chair Favor, just thank you for your support. Thank you. With that, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Thanks, Tim Burrows, Adi Padilla, Brown, Doran's Favor, Remy, President Hart. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 2190 to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into a beneficiary agreement with Mid-Ohio Food Bank in an amount up to $1 million in support of the agency's shelf-stable and fresh food to authorize an expenditure of up to $1 million within the Federal American Rescue Plan Act Fund and to declare an emergency. This ordinance authorizes the, the direct Department of Development to award funds to 45 social service agencies it's using the Federal American Rescue Plan Act funds in the amount of $4.6 million. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a dramatic increase in the level of demand across all human service agencies and particularly within those agencies working to mitigate food insecurity. Mid-Ohio Food Bank has been a strong partner and facilitator for the network of food banks and human service organizations that have experienced those increases in demand. The past two years has created a record demand for record demand far outpacing even the highest peaks of the pandemic and families are being hammered by rising costs and seeking help to feed their families in ever growing numbers. If there are no questions or comments by my colleagues, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bangston, Barossa Di Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Uh, President Harden, may I move, go back to the consent agenda? Please. Thank you. Uh, on the consent agenda we had, which had been moved, is Ordinance 2094-2022 uh, to authorize Executive Director of the Office of Celebrate One on behalf of the Office of Mayor to modify an existing contract with Planned Parenthood of Greater Ohio for teen peer-to-peer -peer reproductive health education in support of the Celebrate One goal to improve reproductive health planning in its high priority neighborhoods, to authorize the transfer within the expenditure of up to $130,000 from city's general fund and declare an emergency. With the Supreme Court decision in Dobbs v. Jackson and the overturning of 50 years of case law in Roe v. Wade, abortion is no longer legal in all 50 states. And the Ohio General Assembly quickly acted to outlaw abortion after the sick weeks mark. This is an absolute atrocity and blow to bodily autonomy, reproductive care, and health equity in the U.S. The reality is that the people who will be most impacted by this decision will be black and brown folks. It is the history of this country. 
maternal and infant mortality are already highest among Ohio's black women. In fact, from 2016 to 2020, black women accounted for only 17% of women giving birth in Ohio, but 34% of pregnancy-related deaths. Infant mortality is 2.5 times higher among, and we also know that this is only going to increase with abortion rights rolled back. Tonight, thank you to the Women's Caucus, we passed three pieces of legislation to protect the reproductive health care of city residents, but I also want to shine a light on the work of Director Stapleton and her team at Celebrate One that have been doing this work for years and express my sincere gratitude and support as your work continues to get a bit harder. Uh, Director Stapleton, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, President Hardin, Chair Favor, and Council. You have two pieces of legislation tonight before you, uh, 2094 and 2117 that are connected. The legislation modifies an existing contract with Planned Parenthood for teen peer-to-peer -peer reproduction health education in support of Celebrate One's goal to improve reproductive health education in our high priority neighborhoods. Those are our neighborhoods that are most affected by infant mortality and largely black and brown communities. For the second year in a row, Planned Parenthood in partnership with Nationwide Children's Hospital has um, decided to conduct a youth empowerment skills development summer program mirroring the success of our 2021 program. It is an eight week summer fellowship program designed with two goals in mind to reproduce what we call the YES program that allows comprehensive sexual health education to provide medically accurate, inclusive, affirming sexual health education in order to empower participants who are middle school and high school students to take advantage of the best choices in their lives and then to provide them with career development to provide thoughtful, engaging education, to engage young people, to build skills, to feel confident entering into professional and employment opportunities. This year's program, we added two components that I think are important. First, we are working with our partners to ensure that our young people get to get up in front of other young people to do professional training for their peers. Um, we're excited about that, and we will have at least 150, 200 more young people exposed to the information as a result. The second thing that we did this year that was different was we added a special events day. Unfortunately, because of the rise in COVID, we had to break it down back to virtual versus in person, but all of the young people will get professional headsets and resumes and things that will prepare them for the next steps of their journey. And so we're very, very excited about that. In conjunction with Planned Parenthood, um, 2117 is the support of Nationwide Children's Hospital. They too work with the summer program, yes, and allow uh, Planned Parenthood to get some support in ensuring that the young people who participate in this program are from those high priority neighborhoods. We doubled down on recruitment and literally doubled the number of young people who are coming from our C1 neighborhoods this year. And we're very excited about that. And it actually, we made it a part of the contract in order to move forward. And so we are grateful for Nationwide Children's uh, support of Planned Parenthood in helping us recruit more young people from our high priority neighborhoods. And we're also grateful that for them to provide staff time that allows us to do the career development piece that we wanted to make sure the young people got in addition to the sexual health education. But in, in addition to the uh, additional support from, for the summer, there's additional money put in to allow us to expand our get real curriculum in middle schools in the 2022 2023 school year. We have been fortunate with your support and the support of the administration to be able to provide teen reproductive health education in 19 of our 23 middle schools. Now more than ever, based on what we know has happened in the law, getting upstream and making a difference and an impact with our young people and educating them as many of them as we can is absolutely critical. So we thank you Chair, for your support. We thank you, Council, for your support. And we are looking forward to expanding to not just our 23 Columbus City Schools, but other opportunities to engage young people to make sure that we can get to as many of them as we can. 
Thank you so much, uh, Director Stapleton. Are there any additional comments or questions? And, and I misspoke. Uh, it was, uh, we were able to pass three pieces of legislation through the leadership of the Women's Caucus, uh, the impeccable leadership of the Women's Caucus, uh, and the support of the, the rest of city council. So I thank my colleagues for that. Uh, it's gonna stick, ladies. Uh, but to the director, um, we are incredibly excited about this initiative and the fact that it is zeroing in on our middle age, or middle school um, age uh, young folks, uh, because we do know as the story has gone national, um, how incredibly important uh, that age range is in ensuring that they are properly educated um, and armed with the tools to make uh, the best choices for themselves. So with that, I move for passage. Bankston, Burroughs, Adi Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hurd. Thank you. That's all I have in my committees. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't. Council Member Burroughs, Adi Padilla. I got you. Thank you. Uh, Ordinance 1723-2022 to authorize the Executive Director of the Office of Celebrate One to accept a grant from the Ohio Department of Medicaid for the Enhanced Maternal Health Program in the amount of $4,520,000 dollars to authorize the appropriation of four million five hundred twenty thousand dollars from the unappropriated balance of the general government grants fund 2020 no 2220 and to authorize multiple contracts with community grantees for the enhanced maternal health programs in Columbus and Central Ohio. The Ohio Department of Medicaid has awarded a grant to celebrate one to coordinate the enhanced maternal health program in Franklin County. This funding will provide continued investment in centering pregnancy options within different hospitals, support for culturally informed doula care, maintain trauma-informed prenatal support through moms-to-be, and support to the information and referral line step one for a healthy pregnancy. This grant is a step towards supporting pregnant people in Columbus before, during, and after giving birth. Uh, Executive Director Stapleton, do, is there anything you would like to add or anything you want to say? Council President Hardin, uh, Vice Chair uh, Barossa de Pardia, thank you. Um, just, just a note, we are very excited. As you know, this is, uh, for some of you, most of you know, this is every two-year process that we go through with our uh, Department of Medicaid at the state. And we're excited to expand three new types of initiatives. One, we understand that mental health and the pandemic and pregnant and parenting moms has become a challenge. And so we are able to give additional resources to um, POEM to expand mental health resources for moms. Second, um, we understand based on the data from the Department of Health that we have a crisis in one of our, in, in several of our zip codes, but one in particular, 43232. Uh, we will be able to use money to work directly with two uh, service community-based organizations, the Mother, Mother's Cove and um, uh, Urban Family Development that, that runs Dads-to-Be to expand services to families in that particular zip, zip code and provide a community education piece and a community engagement piece about what we can do in that zip code to ch churn, turn some of our uh, trajectory and numbers around. And then finally, um, uh, I know many of you have an interest in doula care. Um, if indeed Medicaid goes forward with doula expansion and covering those costs for a doula, we would not have enough people in this city right now to perform the services that we would want them to provide. Mm -hmm. So we will be working with providers over this next year, hopefully local providers, to expand the number of doulas who are able to serve our moms. And when Medicaid makes that decision, we will have that cadre of champions ready to advocate and work with our moms. Questions or comments from my colleagues? And again, I just wanna echo um, Chair Favor's remarks. Thank you for your leadership. Um, and thank you for being an incredible partner for the resources that you provide um, to folks in our community to ensure that they are healthy and that our community is healthy. And we said it earlier today, an investment in women, an investment in parents is an investment in communities, right? Because when they are healthy, they make healthy choices and they raise healthy people. So thank you. Um, if there are no other questions, I move for to waive second reading by voice. Mr. Bankston? Abstain. Ms. Barossa Di Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Faber? Yes. 
it's just 1723. Which number are we on? 1723. Sorry, I was on the wrong page. <laughs> yeah. Wait, he, he didn't need it. Same. I was on the wrong page. I've talked. Sh should I go reconsider? Just start the vote over. Okay. Mr. Bankston. As member of the caucus that supports women, <laughs> yes. Ms. Barossa Di Padilla. <laughs> yes. Ms. Brown. Abstain. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Faber. Abstain. Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes. I now move for passage. Mr. Bankston. Yes. yes. Ms. Barossa Di Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Abstain. Mr. Dorrance. Yes. Ms. Favor. <laughs> Mr. Remy. Yes. President Harden. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Now and I'm done. Back to Chair Favor. <laughs> I was turned around. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> next is Council Member Sandra Stacey Mitchell. Yes. Thank you very much, Council President Harden. It's getting close to my bedtime. <laughs> Our first ordinance is 2066 2022 to authorize the Director of Public Safety to enter into a contract for maintenance and repair services for Crime Lab Instruments with Specialty Underwriters LLC to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code, Chapter 329, to authorize the expenditure of $91,598 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. The Division of Police Crime Lab has various scientific instruments that require maintenance and repair services by the manufacturer. This equipment is used to process and present evidence for criminal prosecutions, which requires our strict adherence to rules of evidence and establish mandatory timeliness. Deputy Director Speaks, could you speak to the waiving of competitive bidding please thank you chairman Remy uh, mr. chairman this vendor is qualified by our various manufacturers they are able to perform this work quicker than sending the instruments back to the manufacturer uh, likewise it is we estimate 24% cheaper utilizing this vendor as we have for the last four years for those reasons of both cost being less expensive and speed so that the instruments uh, there's no downtime we respectfully request weight bidding and for the passage of this ordinance thank you thank you deputy director are there any questions or comments from my colleagues this evening seeing none I move for passage okay. Bankston Barosa de Padilla Brown Doran's favor Remy President Harden now if we could go back to page six of the agenda for first read ordinance number 2132 2022 to authorize and direct the finance to direct the finance and management director to sell to officer Shannon David office, uh, light, badge number 1756 for the sum of one dollar a police horse with registered name of joy which has no further value to the division of police and to waive the provisions of the city code sale of city-owned personal property joy is a mounted poli uh, police horse that has been in service with the division of police's mount mounted unit since 2015 needs to be retired and sold joy is having intestinal issues that cause her to kick when she is touched on the left side. Due to her health issues, years of service, and her uncontrolled kicking at times, the division is requesting that the horse be retired and sold. It would be in the best interest of the division to take Joy out of service and leave and retire her. It is recommended that Joy be sold to Officer Shannon David. Officer David has resources to properly care for Joy. Additionally, the Division of Police Legal Bureau has developed a general release document that relinquishes the City of Columbus from any liability as it relates to the post-retirement care and control of Joy and assigns the liability of Officer to Officer Shannon David. Um, we moved this up because obviously um, uh, the health issues and of course stabling her for another couple of months um, is best served under the care of Officer Shannon Davis. So if there are any questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for Pat, I move to waive second reading. Bankston, Barossa Di Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Waive. And now I move for passage. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barossa Di Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. That's all I have in the safety committee. May I proceed to the administration committee? Please. Tonight, I have ordinance 2076-2022 to accept the recommendations of the Citizens Commission on elected official compensation and to amend the management compensation plan by amending sections 5EC-180, City Attorney E, 5EC-185, City Auditor E, 
5E, C215, City Council Member 5E, C220, City Council President and 5E, M090, Mayor. In November 2014, Columbus voters approved a series of ballot issues which amended the Columbus City Charter. Included among the changes was a mandate to establish a Citizens Commission on Elected Officials' Compensation to review and recommend the salary for each elected officer of the city, with the underlying goal of increasing citizen engagement and adding an additional layer of accountability to the process of setting future pay rates for elected officials in Columbus. The 2018 Citizens Commission on Elected Official Compensation issued its reports and recommendations in September 2018 and the Commission's recommendations were enacted by City Council pursuant to Ordinance 3300-2018 for the years 2022 through 2025. In January 2022, Mayor Andrew Ginther and City Council President Shannon Harden formed the 2022 Citizens Commissions on Elected Officials' Compensation as required under Section 152 of the Columbus City Charter and charged them with reviewing compensation for the Mayor, City Council Members, City Council President, City Attorney, and City Auditor, and make salary recommendations, including an annual cost of living adjustment to not exceed the average increase in the Consumer Price Index over the preceding four years. The Commission members included Michael Kassler as the chair, Dr. Keisha Hundley Jenkins, Sarah Ingalls, Kiana Williams, Fred Rancier. The 2022 Compensation Commission held nine meetings, including a public hearing before finalizing recommendations for the salary of each elected official of the city. Under the Columbus City Charter, setting elected official salaries will still require a public vote of city council. Council may accept and enact the commission's recommendations in whole or in part. Council may enact all of the recommendations as submitted, some of the recommendations as submitted, or may enact an amount less than recommended. However, council is prohibited from enacting any amount greater than the recommendations. The salaries for all of the City of Columbus elected officials were set in Ordinance Number 3300-2018, pursuant to City Charter Section 15, salaries for these positions cannot be e increased or diminished during an elected official's term in office. This ordinance amends the management compensation plan to set salaries for the mayor, city auditor, city council members, city council president, and the city attorney for years 2026, 2027, 2028, and 2029. Bless you. This ordinance is the culmination of the work of the Elected Officials' Compensation Commission. The commission is an independent citizen-led commission charged with setting the rate of the pay for elected officials in Columbus. The commission reviewed numerous data sets from surrounding peer cities and similarly situated peer cities nationwide and engaged in rigorous discussion over the course of three months before submitting their recommendations to this body. The commission anchored their decision, the median per capita of salary for each elected official office. I want to thank all commissioners who served on this commission. This was not an easy task and included a great deal of availability and commitment. I feel the commission held a thorough and transparent process that was well communicated to the public. I also want to thank Naya Walters and City Council's Legislative Research Office for serving and providing guidance to the commission. Um, this is not easy work as they labor through many different cities and what they're they're doing to make sure that we're on par with the leading cities in the country as Columbus now is. Um, what was that section? I thought there was that one section that I, hold on one second, go back one thing here. Um, the commission's recommendations, which would begin January 1st, 2026, are as follows. 14% for mayor, 40% for council president, 13% for council members, 10% for the city attorney, and 5% for the city auditor. Each elected office would also receive a cost of living adjustment each year. It is important to note that these recommendations are just that, recommendations. Council may go below, but must not exceed the recommendations of the commission. And after reviewing the commission's recommendations, council decided on the following increases, 13% for mayor, council president, and the council members, and 5% for the city attorney and city auditor. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments this evening? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa, Di Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. That's all I have in administration. With your permission, I'll move to rules and reference. Sure. Now I have Ordinance 2157-2022 to enact new Chapter 174 of the Columbus City Codes to ensure language access services for persons of limited English proficiency to better interact with city government and to declare an emergency. 
The city provides programming and services that need to be accessible to all residents from registration forms for programs 311 and emergency services. Some city offices have instituted clear policies for providing these materials and services in other languages as may be necessary for much of the city's new American population, which may have limited English proficiency. However, in order to ensure that Columbus is a welcoming city, it is necessary to introduce into our city code a requirement that all city offices, based on the, their level of providing vital public documents and services to residents, provide some level of language access services that our diverse immigrant, refugee, and migrant population can have the same levels of access as those with greater English proficiency. So this ordinance creates new chapter 174 to require city offices to provide these services as are deemed necessary by each office and to create policies that will cover such items as identifying public documents for translation, interpretation services, annual reporting, and community outreach efforts. The City of Columbus represents and welcomes all residents regardless of national origin and all city offices are committed to making Columbus a city that provides opportunity for all. This ordinance continues Council's efforts to make Columbus a truly welcoming city. This item, this item has been a long time coming, and I'm so thankful that we are close to the finish line. Um, I want to serve a city that strives to give every resident independent access to its services. Passage of this ordinance and a creation of the language access code is the next step finalizing and implementing the language access policy. I uh, cannot thank uh, Director Brandon enough, um, along with my staff, Jeffrey Carter, Lucy Frank, and my intern, Zeta Jenkins, for all their work over the last several years as we work towards getting this um, finally across the finish line. Um, it's been a labor of love, and we are excited to watch the work ahead as we implement this in 2023. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues this evening? Seeing none, I move for passage. Thank you for your leadership, Council Member, on this. This is something that you've worked on for several years, and we're glad to be at this point. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Clerk, please call the roll. Bangston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. And finally, if we can go back to page seven of the agenda, I have the ordinance 1617 2022 to supplement the Columbus Zoning Code Title 33, Chapter 3312, Off Street Parking and Loading, to add new sections 30. 31255 through 331258, which include requirements to install electric vehicle charging infrastructure in certain newly constructed parking spaces in accordance with the requirements provided herein. The City of Columbus has adopted bold climate and equity goals to ensure that we do our part to combat global climate change and ensure a healthy and prosperous community for all residents now and in the future. Columbus's Climate Action Plan outlines a set of commitments to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change while focusing on community needs and proven best practices. Adoption of an electric vehicle ready parking ordinance is a priority action in the city's climate action plan. The purpose of this ordinance is to provide widespread access to electric vehicle charging throughout the city to prepare for rapid electric vehicle adoption, improve local air quality, and achieve the city's climate and equity goals in an accessible and inclusive manner. Electric vehicles require charging stations to provide power to the vehicles. The vast majority of the parking facilities are not currently constructed to accommodate the installation of electric vehicle charging stations. The city will collect and review usage data from installed EV chargers on an annual basis every three years starting in 2027. The city will reconvene stakeholders to discuss and evaluate usage rate, rates of the installed EV charging stations, new developments in charging technology, and local electric vehicle adoption rates. Based on that evaluation, market trends, and feedback from stakeholders, the city may propose revisions to the requirements provided in this legislation to ensure that Columbus's projected electric vehicle charging needs are met while providing equitable access to EV charging infrastructure throughout the city. I would like to um, thank my colleague, Councilmember Dorans, for his um, ongoing support and leadership and helping to get this policy across this, the finish line. We work together as a team uh, with the B Department of Building and Zoning Services and, of course, the Office of Sustainability. Um, thank you to the, the Chief Sustainability Officer, Brian Clark, and, and um, Deputy Director Tony Celebrezzi. I, um, it's been a lot of work, but it has come to a conclusion where we had both our development community and our building 
BIA community in support of the project. And so uh, we are forever thankful for that. I'm going to turn the floor over to Councilmember Dorn to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Remy. Uh, again, want to thank you and your team for your hard work on this, uh, leading uh, a good chunk of these efforts. I uh, did just want to also thank uh, Pat Hook from uh, IBW 683 here in Columbus that testified in favor of this legislation and worked with us to identify the, the right training standard to apply uh, to make sure that folks that are doing this work um, know what they're doing as we're constructing new 21st century infrastructure. We want to make sure that folks that are doing so um, know what they're doing and can make sure that that infrastructure is long lasting for, uh, for it to last for, for folks here, here in Columbus. So um, again, this was a um, lots of different literally moving pieces together with this legislation uh, and appreciate everyone's involvement. And with that, we'd love to uh, turn the floor over to Mr. Celebrezzi. Thank you, council member. Uh, in the interest of time and uh, not repeating a lot of what uh, Councilman Remy has stated, uh, just want to make one, one additional point. Uh, we spent more than nine months working with not only the building community, uh, members of the community, area commissions, uh, environmental groups to put this piece of legislation together. Um, we deliberately left it somewhat vague to allow the developers to make a lot of the decisions as to where these, these parking spaces are to uh, allow them flexibility for their different projects that they're working on. So uh, with that, uh, I do want to, uh, as Councilmember Remy said, thank uh, Department of Utilities for, for all their help uh, working with them uh, to uh, bring this legislation and uh, also with uh, Councilmember Remy and Councilmember Dorans for their willingness to champion this. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to, uh, to answer them. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues this evening? With seeing none, I move to uh, waive second reading. Clerk, please call the roll. Thanks, Tim Burris, Adipa Dia, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Waived. Now I move to amend it, submit it to the clerk. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Amend it. And finally, I move for passage as amended. <coughs> Clerk, let's call the row. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you, Council President. That is all I have on my committees this evening. Thank you, sir. The final three ordinances uh, in the Rules and Reference Committee are relating to the city's charter and the citizen led Charter Review Commission. This commission was seated in January and met from February to July to discuss potential amendments and get feedback. This commission and council hosted 13 public meetings in all. Each were in person and streamed through CTV. I chaired one of the public hearings earlier this month to solicit additional public feedback. Residents were able to submit comment via the commission's website. The commission recommended three changes regarding uh, the uh, uh, three, uh, the commission recommended three changes. Uh, one, being initiated petitions reforms. Two, being civil service reforms. And three, city charter modernization. Council was advancing all of the recommendations from the commission to voters for this November's election. Ordinance 2198-2022 is critical to prevent future scams like the Pro Energy Group try to push on voters. It is similar to reforms that the state of Ohio implemented in 2015 in response to casino and marijuana ballot initiatives to prevent monopolies in city code or charter. If an issue is determined to violate the ban, council must place two issues on the ballot, one to approve or disapprove the clear violation and one that actually will, that will actually allow the voting on that ordinance or charter amendment. The commission also recommended extending the signature collection period for petitions from one year to two years, as well as adding a 10 day curing period for signature collection should the initial petition have an insufficient number of signatures. Ordinance 2199-2022 alters civil service and city staffing requirements. The central reform is a change to test banding, uh, altering language from no fewer than three bands to no more than three bands allowing additional flexibility for test banding done via ordinance or policy. This legislation also removes and replaces unlawful language, references to aspects of age and sex as being requirements of some positions. Finally, ordinance 2200-2022 
aims to address this city modernization. Our charter was written more than 100 years ago, so it needs to be updated to ensure the public's business can be conducted efficiently and effectively. This includes allowing for business by virtual meetings. This legislation also includes changes specific to the auditor's office to improve efficiency. Before I read the uh, titles of the ordinances, are there any comments or questions by my colleagues? We have one speaker on um, specifically the first ordinance, 2198, Mr. Bill Lyons. I'll go ahead and call you up now. Kind of surprised it stuck it out here. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be this long. Yeah. This is the longest uh, I had to speak here. So, yes, I'm Bill Lyons, uh, 245 Wahala Hall Road. And I'm speaking mostly on behalf of uh, our group, Columbus Community Bill of Rights. So, good evening, <laughs> President Hardin and uh, uh, all other members uh, of uh, Columbus City Council. Uh, all of you, except most, the most recent council members, are very familiar with our group, Columbus Community Bill of Rights. We're an all-volunteer group that's worked tirelessly for four citizen initiatives, uh, campaigns to protect our water from fracking waste. We were, on our fourth campaign, we were nine months into it, having collected 9,000 signatures, and well on our way to being only the second initiated charter uh, uh, Columbus City Charter re uh, Amendment, City Charter Amendment, to ever make the ballot. So it shows how hard it is. Uh, when, in March 2020, COVID disrupted our lives because we were not granted any remedy for the one-year time limit on signature gathering, our campaign unjustly came to an end. So uh, regarding the ordinance 2198, dash 2022 on the initiative process is what I want to speak about. So first of all, our group is glad that council has included the 10 day cure period as recommended by the Charter Review Commission to remedy a signature deficit once petitions are submitted if signatures are found to be insufficient. This is only a reasonable request and it's done at the state level it would benefit those initiatives that are short by a small number and uh, instead of having to start all over. So that we are in favor of. Um, now, regarding the recommendation of the two-year time limit, uh, we feel that this limitation is still too short. Of course, two years are better than one, uh, but for 100 years, uh, until or prior to 2014, uh, Columbus had no time limit on petitioning, but there was no problem cited at that time or legitimate reason for the one-year time limitation being placed on initiative in, in 2014 for that Charter Review Commission that put it on the ballot. Also, no other city in Ohio except Dayton imposes any time limit at all uh, nor does the state on state initiatives, on the initiative process. So uh, petition committees want to get their initiatives on the ballot as soon as possible. Certainly we do. However, now that we live in a time of pandemic, sadly, or other foreseen, unforeseen circumstances, petitioning may have to be suspended for some time for public safety. Um, so uh, it, and also that the longer it takes to file petitions, the more signatures that are required uh, because some voters who have signed may have uh, moved or their registrations expire. So I just have another paragraph. Moreover, most events that have occurred, uh, big events this year, like ComFest, Red, White, and Boom, and most recently the Jazz and Rip Fest, last occurred three years ago in 2019. So a two-year time limit would not have been fair or just for groups uh, collecting signatures during that time period. So the city charter should provide time to account for either 
another COVID variant that we have lockdown orders for, another pandemic or some other foreseen emergency that would make it unsafe, impractical to collect signatures. So therefore, we respectively ask that you consider uh, tonight to amend that proposed change uh, from section 42-7 of the city charter by simply changing the words of two years to a longer time frame. So that's our request, but um, thank you. And if you have any questions, uh, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Lyons. Uh, thank you for your advocacy. Uh, I, I think that your group's advocacy is what moved uh, the, the recommendations uh, to get to where we are today. I think uh, even in talking to the chair post, the chair of the commission, it literally was advocacy of your organization that uh, moved it from one year to two years. Um, I think council is inclined to accept the recommendations, all of the recommendations from the commission. Um, that's why we seek commissions to do the hard work and to have the feedback and then make recommendations to us. And so uh, we appreciate your advocacy. We appreciate the work. Um, and I think you, you made it better. You made this charter go around better. Um, and, and again, this is one step in the process. The next step, this will, if my colleagues vote, we'll put it on the ballot. Then the residents of Columbus will get the final say uh, on what the actual ballot is. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. All right, thank you. I <clears throat> uh, just want to thank again the Charter Review Commission um, led by Trudy Bartley. Uh, and the commissioners, we really appreciate all your work um, to get us to this point. So ordinance 2198-2022 to submit to the electors of the city of Columbus at a special election to be held concurrently with the regular general election on November 8, 2022. The question of amending the charter of the city of Columbus, such question to be known as proposed charter amendment number one, initiative process and to declare an emer emergency. My bad. Yes. I just have a quick question of city Please, attorney's I'm office. So sorry. No, that's fine. I, just on 2198 sure. specifically, um, I wanted to just clarify a, a portion. Um, if city attorney's office could indulge me, there is a, a portion in the change that um, uh, in this initiative petition process that that talks about banning the specifying or determining of a tax rate, um, and I know that the proposed language is around preventing uh, self-dealing in initiated petitions. And I just want to clarify that clause um, and the proper way to read it and interpret it in law. Um, it is my understanding it is not intended to prevent citizens' abilities uh, to propose dedicated revenue if it's going to publicly funded goods rather than self-dealing. And I just wanted to get that understanding from um, city attorney's office. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, President Pro Tem Brown, Council President Harden, members of council, thank you. Uh, yes, I agree with you, um, President Pro Tem Brown, that the language in section 4216A that refers to the power of initiative shall not be used to pass an ordinance or amendment to the city charter that would specify or determine a tax rate for uh, any person, non-public entity, or group of persons or non-public entities. The caveat is that is not then available to other similarly situated persons or non-public entities. So what a group could not do is say, make a carve out that says that only people whose last name is Smith pay a certain tax rate where everybody else pays a higher tax rate. Um, especially if something were to serve a public purpose that benefits the greater community, that certainly would not violate the provision of uh, 4216A. So the caveat language at the end that is not then available to other similarly situated persons or non-public entities is what would allow what you're referring to is a more broad uh, ordinance initiated that would have a greater purpose and not only apply to a very small designated group. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense and I appreciate that clarification um, ensuring that citizens still have that power mm -hmm. um, to in the in the initiated uh, p uh, petition process. Yeah. So thank you for the clarification on sort of the public good the public interest and that's all I had. Um, I appreciate that that um, 
question actually gave me time to recognize that John Oswald, the person who staffed this commission for six months, did so much work, is also here and want to thank him. John, is there anything that you want to add to tonight? You are a man of so many words, so I know. <laughs> at... Yeah, all right. <laughs> I think I've read the ordinance, so uh, is there a second? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Ordinance 2199-2022 to submit to the electors of the City of Columbus at a special election to be held concurrently with the regular general election on November 8th, 2022. The question of amending the Charter of the City of Columbus, such question to be known as Proposed Charter Amendment Number 2, Civil Service, and to declare an emergency. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Ordinance 2020. At Ordinance 2200-2022 to submit to the electors of the City of Columbus at a special election to be held concurrently with the regular general election on November 8, 2022, the question of amending the Charter of the City of Columbus, such question to be known as Proposed Charter Amendment Number 3, City Modernization, and to declare an emergency. Are there any questions or comments? Is there a second? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favorimi, President Hardin. Past. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we will not. We will see you again here on September 12th. We will see you out in the community in the meantime. Have a great break. Clerk, please call the roll for adjournment. Yes. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>